Why were we created in the first place? How did we get here? And also, what's our purpose in life? How can we know any of these things? A God of Abraham, a God of Moses, a God of Jesus. Who are you talking about? How may we know this God? Who is this God related to? Allah ordered Muhammad, peace be upon him, call, say to them, he is Allah alone without any partners. This is one of the most important facets of Islam. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Join us now for Facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. And for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about one of the facets of Islam. Peace. One of the amazing things that we find these days, so many people are trying to define what is Islam. What is Islam exactly? From non-Muslims, we hear many strange and amazing stories. Even from Muslims, we get various opinions and sometimes confusion. But when I ask the Muslim, what is Islam? And they said to me, well, Islam is peace. I had to wonder. I had to wonder, how did you come up with this particular definition of Islam? Then when I came to know and understand that the word Islam is Arabic, of course, and it comes from a root, salama. But the word for peace in Arabic is salam. It comes from the same root, but it's not the same word. Why? They said, well, you see, Islam is something much bigger than just peace. It is peace, but it's bigger than peace. And I said, what? Exactly what are you trying to tell me? But as you begin to understand the breakdown of the meaning of this fabulous and wonderful gem, this Islam, then you can begin to understand this concept. We begin with the first of the words. The first of the word is surrender. This is in the word Islam, surrender, to give up. The second word is submission, to give in. The third word is obedience, to totally obey. The fourth word is sincerity. And then this word, peace. But this peace is not about peace on earth. Although that's there, this is a part of it as well. It's not just talking about peace in the Middle East. Although this is something that we would all enjoy very much. But it's a peace between the one who is the subordinate, the one who is the subdominant, the one who is beneath. It is the relationship between the servant and the master. To be at peace through the other four, totally surrendering, totally submitting, completely obeying in sincerity to achieve peace. The peace between the created and the creator. The peace between the slave and the master. The peace between the Abdi and the Allah. And if I really believe and having the perfect relationship with my Creator, then I realize immediately I have to do so on His terms. 
because I didn't create him. Rather, he created me. It's up to him to tell me what the proper way is. It's interesting, another facet in Islam that's very much right in line with this one is that facet of deen. We say the way of Islam, the deen of Islam. Because we don't consider it like a religion. It's much bigger. It's more inclusive. And all of this works together as we're going to discover in upcoming episodes. But this peace, and how do I get this peace? How do I get this salam that we're talking about? If I surrender to him on his terms, I submit totally to what he has ordained, to what he has ordered. I obey his commandments. I do so in sincerity. Then I will be at peace with whatever is the ultimate outcome. I want to think about that a minute. Surrender. Give up. Give up. I give up. I surrender. But to surrender doesn't really mean you're ready to do more than that. No. The next word, submit. This implies immediately there are going to be some terms of surrender here. There's going to be some documentation drawn up and signed. Yes, we're going to have a peace treaty. Yes, you're going to sign it. Yes, you're going to agree to some terms. And then the third word, obedience. Well, you surrendered. You've agreed to these terms. You've promised to uphold your end of the bargain. And now comes what? Now comes the obedience. The obedience. Will you really do it? And not only will you do it, but look. Look at this one. And this is key. Sincerity. Because what good is it that you just do it for a show? Or you do it for the people to watch? So what good is that? Without sincerity, what is that? Am I really doing it for him? Or am I just doing it for the people? Am I doing it to show off? Sincerity. Then comes peace. And what kind of peace are we talking about? So many people talk about peace. We've heard many speeches, lectures, orations on the subject of peace. And poetry. Stories. But then when we get down to this subject, what do we really mean? I recall many, many years ago when I was sitting with a friend of mine. One of those rainy days where you like to sit and perhaps play games together. Just past the time of day. He turned to me and he said, By the way, do you know what every human being wants? I said, sure I do. <laughs> That's easy. He said, what is it? I said, well, you know and I know. Everybody wants money. He said, no, you're absolutely wrong. I said, what? Tell me somebody doesn't want money. He said, no, I can guarantee you there will be some who will say they don't care about money. I said, oh, really? He said, yes. But every human wants one thing. I had to think. I had to wonder, what was he talking about? Then I thought a bit. I said, a woman, a good woman, a wife. He said, now would a woman want another wife? I said, oh, no, no, wait, that's wrong. That wouldn't make any sense at all. Uh, could it be a good job? He said, would a child want a job? I said, uh, long life. He said, there's one common denominator, one thing that all people want. And all the other things that they're trying to get is really an effort to achieve this one single goal in life. Now, he really had me thinking, and I was really straining my brain, trying to reach out. What is he saying? What's he talking about? Not money, not a wife. Not a position, not long life. What is it? What could it be? Education. 
<laughs> he started laughing. He said, no, you're not even close. Fame, fame is important. He said, no. Finally, I gave up. I said, there's nothing that I can think of that's the common denominator for everybody. You're talking about everybody. How about in China, Russia, India, Arabia, Africa, Europe, the Americas, everywhere, the same thing? He said, yes. Everybody wants the same thing? Then just as a joke, I said, how about ice cream? I like ice cream. <laughs> and he laughed. He said, no, that's not it either. I said, tell me, tell me, I have to know what is it that everybody wants. He said, peace. I said, what? He said, peace. Peace. He said, why do you think people want money? Because they believe it will bring them peace in their hearts. Why do people want fame? Because they believe it will bring them the peace that they need. Why do people take drugs, drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes? Because they want peace. They don't have peace. And they feel that this is the way to achieve it. I had to think. Well, yeah, yeah, it does make sense. And he said, and it's the same for all the people all over the world. Even a tiny baby, when he cries out to his mother, for what? For milk. He wants it so that it will fill his stomach and then he'll feel what? Comfortable, and this will give him peace. And then he'll go to sleep. Yes? I tried to disprove it. I tried to think of some other aspects of that. Well, what about, no, well, that would be right. What would a person turn to? Yeah, because ultimately he would think, hmm, why do people steal? Why do they lie? What's the motivator behind everything that people do, whether good or bad? Because they're trying to achieve. Some through the legitimate aspects, of course, that we would accept as, as Muslims, as Christians, as Jews, as proper Hindus. You would accept certain good things that people would do to achieve their peace. And then there's those who will attempt shortcuts, and they'll go for the easy way. And this and that, stealing, lying, robbing, cheating, etc. The facet of Islam that we're talking about here is salam. Salam or peace of Islam is mentioned in the Quran in the most beautiful way. Uh, even the way that an, one Muslim greets another Muslim is to ask for the blessing of peace to be upon them. We find this in the previous scriptures that it came from before. And we find it in the Quran. The order that when you come upon your people, you greet them in this most beautiful greeting. And you say to them, peace be upon all of you. Assalamu alaikum. Isn't that lovely? And the response, and to you also be all peace. Wa alaikum assalam. But then... We're still on the level of human to human, aren't we? We're still talking about ourselves and others. Then we come to learn in Islam that this facet of Islam is in fact the name of the Creator Himself. This is the One Himself who created everything and gave it life and gives death. And brings it back to life again. The one who sustains. The one who brings forth. The one who takes away. His name is. Salam. This is one of the attributes or characteristics. Of the almighty one God of Islam. He is a Salam. A Salam. That's the name. One of the many names of almighty. Almighty Salam. Because he's always in peace. He's the epitome of peace. Some are named the servant of the Almighty Salam. Abdus Salam. Abdus Salam. Abdus Salam. What a lovely name. And to be in the peace of the peace. In other words, he is the peace. And by the way, 
If you think about it, the attributes of Almighty God are not like something you could really compare to anything in this earth. Because the, he is the epitome, the absolute of what his names and characteristics are. I can be at peace. I need to be at peace. Ah, but it's not going to last long, is it? Before the cell phone will go off or I'll get some email. Someone will knock at the door. There will be an interruption. I'll have some need that I'll have to tend to. And where will be my peace? If I don't seek peace from him, what will be the peace? It won't be everlasting and it won't be enduring. So the peace of Islam is to seek this from the one who is the peace. And he can give you peace in your heart regardless of the circumstances that are around you. It was one of the mighty prophets of Almighty God, the last prophet and messenger of Allah. He told us, Ajib, amazing is the condition, the condition of a true believer because he's always at peace. He's always okay. Nothing bad happens to him. He's always in a good way. The people were amazed. What does that mean? He said, peace be upon him. He said mm. that whenever good comes his way, he's thankful. He's appreciative. He says, alhamdulillah. He's very thankful to Allah. And when any difficulty comes his way, then he's in patience. It's called sabr, another beautiful facet in Islam. And then, he is still in this peace because he believes, he totally believes that whatever comes to him is from his creator. It's only a test. And he's going to be all right. He needs to learn how to persevere. He needs to learn how to have patience. He needs to understand that it's all from him, the one and only. And that if I really want to get the peace in this life, and have the peace in the next life, then it's important for me to first recognize this facet, this beautiful facet in Islam, that it's there. It's always there. Because all of the characteristics, all of these attributes that we speak about of Almighty Allah are always available. Available, they're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. If you want peace, you have to go to the one who is peace and seek peace from him. And you can have it in your life anytime you need it. But you first have to recognize that it's real and it's only going to come from there. You can't create it yourself. You have to. You have to open up and let him, the one who is peace, put this peace in your life. Then... As the good things come or the calamities roll by, you can hold that middle course in peace. This facet of Islam is one that has been passed on for generations. It started with Adam. It came with Ibrahim. It was with Moses. And it came with Jesus. And it came with Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon them all. And they all insisted on this very important aspect to be in peace with whatever comes your way. Some of the companions of Moses had witnessed the parting of the waters. They had gone through the Red Sea and all the time that they were going through this Red Sea with the enemy, Pharaoh, right behind them on their heels with his army. And yet look how the one who created them in the first place, brought them through this difficulty, brought them out to the other side, and then drowned their enemies in their wake. And then, and then, how this all was offered to them in such beautiful peace. And their prophet Moses, peace be upon him, he went up into the mountain. He was there for so many days, so many nights. And he was there in the presence of Islam, the beast. We can only imagine what that must be like, huh?
And then he came to his people and he found them worshiping, worshiping something other, other than the peace. The golden calf that they had erected was an abomination in front of the Lord. This false worship. And how their prophet Moses, peace be upon him, came to them and realized what they were doing and how it must have torn at him to see that here, the one who had given them all this opportunity, put the peace literally in their hands, given them the keys to the paradise, the key to the success of being in this life. And they threw it all away for this false worship. And that's what we all do every day. Anytime we forget about the peace, the real peace, we've done the same thing. When a person begins to worship their job, when they begin to worship their money, when they begin to worship anything that is created other than the creator, then they've done that very thing. They've destroyed the peace right in front of their own eyes. They've given away this opportunity to be in this real beautiful state. It's a mental state. It's a physical state. And it's a spiritual state. And when it's all together the same, then the person is the most peace they can be. Sincere worship for the one and only to surrender to him, to submit to him, to obey him, to be sincere with him. This is to achieve that peace. My friend was right, wasn't he? Whether he was just playing a game with me or he was really tapping into the deepest spiritual answer to the problems that plague humanity from the beginning until now, still the answer is the same, isn't it? It's true. It's an absolute truth that you won't know peace until you know the one who is peace. And he is a salam, the one and only creator, sustainer, and owner of the universe. That's why I like to end some of our programs by mentioning this and giving these salams and asking for the peace and asking him. And this is not new. It was asked also by the prophets before and the beautiful prayers and calling on him and asking for his will to be done on earth, that peace to be done on earth as is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy name of peace. Thy kingdom come in peace. Thy will be done in peace. Peace on earth and peace for all mankind. Amin. Salam. Salam alaikum. Islam, like any precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Let us explore together the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. And for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about one of the many beautiful facets of Islam. In this particular episode, we'll deal with the subject of ikhlas or sincerity. The word ikhlas from the Arabic language implies so much, and yet we have so little to work with in the English. We substitute the word sincerity. But a class means so much more. There is a particular portion of the Quran called a surah named Ikhlas, Surah Al Ikhlas. And it deals with the sincerity in belief and worship 
of the one true God. A very lovely and wonderful work within the Quran itself. It goes something like this. A'udhu billahi min shaitani rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid. Wa lam yulad. Wa lam yakul lahu. Kufuwan ahad. The meaning in the English language is best understood when we see the context with which it came to the Prophet. Muhammad, peace be upon him, over 1400 years ago. It was when his own tribal members had come to him, accusing him of bringing magic or falsehood to them in replacing their religion of paganism, idols, statues, and so on. They were asking him. Who is this God you're speaking of? A God of Abraham, a God of Moses, a God of Jesus. Who are you talking about? How may we know this God? Who is this God related to? Is he related to Alat, Uzzah, Manat? Which of the gods? Is it a brother? Is it a sister? Tell us, if you will. And they were basically making fun of him and what he was teaching them about this ikhlas or sincerity only for Allah. Before he could even begin to answer them, the answer came with the speech of Allah in the Quran. And Allah ordered Muhammad, peace be upon him, call, say to them, He is Allah, the Ahad. And this word Ahad is best understood from the Arabic when you know that the word Wahid means one, but the word Ahad means one that has no two going to come after it. So usually we use the word in English, unique. Say he is Allah, the unique, uniquely one, that he is the samad. And again, words won't suffice in English. Samad, eternally sought after by the creation, looking for sustenance. While he, the creator, is in no need from what he's created. But yet in Arabic, so simple, you just say, as-samad. And it's one of the names of Almighty Allah, As-Samad. Lam, which means absolutely no. Yalid, not the son of anybody. Walam Yulad, he's not the father of any progeny. He's having no genealogy. Walam Yakullahu Kufuwanahad. And he is not like unto anything in his creation. There is nothing anywhere, any time, any place like him. And then again repeating that he is Ahad, unique. And this is called Ikhlas. Yet in the surah or chapter itself, we don't hear the word Ikhlas, do we? But we understand the Ikhlas because if a person really believes this, and they have pronounced this, then they are on Ikhlas. They are on this kind of sincerity. As a matter of fact, these few words that I've uttered to you from the Qur'an have such impact and weight with Allah that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that this is equal to one-third of the Qur'an itself. Imagine if these few words could have such an impact to be worthy, to be considered as a third of the Quran. I began to look through the Quran and try to understand why. How does that work? I have an edition of the Quran which is printed with colored letters so that any time Allah is mentioned or any of his names is mentioned, these are all in the red letters. As I began to turn the pages of the Quran, I discovered an amazing thing that there were red letters on every single page. So much so that I could just open the Quran to any place in the beginning, in the middle, toward the end. And the last part, the last seventh or eighth or ninth. And no matter where I turned, no matter where I looked in the Quran, I found red, red letters. Then I began to understand. Allah is mentioned on every page in his book. Everywhere I look. 
There's Allah. There's Allah's name and His attributes. He truly is a Samad. The one who doesn't need from His creation. Creation needs from Him. He truly is a Had. So unique. <laughs> there can't be another like Him. There is no pair. There's no match. And then we look to His name itself. Allah. That's His name is Allah. What does Allah mean? And I thought, I need to know. When I studied the ancient scriptures in the Hebrew, when I looked to the Aramaic, I found that this is the same essence. He's called El, or Eloi, or Eli, or Lilahi, Allah. And how do we understand more about this? How, how can I get some essence of knowledge to know who he is and what he is and who he's not and what he is not all about? He tells us in another part of his Quran, in the very beginning part, the second chapter, it's called the cow, al-Baqarah. Chapter 2, verse 255. Something amazing that he says. A'udhu billahi min shaitani rajeem. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la naum. Lahu ma fis samawati wa ma fil ard. مَنْ ضَلَّذِي يَشْفَعُ إِنْدُهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ يَلَامُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِهِمْ وَمَا خَوْفُهُمْ وَاللَّهُ يُهِيتُنَّ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ إِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَشَاءٍ وَاسِيَةٌ كُرْسِيَةٌ هُسْمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا يَأُودُهُ هِفْتُهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Now, if you understand the Arabic language. And you're even believing anything at all about God. You would see in this very verse the essence of the true belief, the true sincerity of understanding. He says, He is Allah beside whom there's none other to be worshipped. And he continues to let you know exactly his status of what he does and what he doesn't do. Al-Hay. Al-Hay means what? This is eternally and always alive. The epitome of this. He never dies. Al-Hayyul Qayyum. Qayyum, what is that? Totally self-subsisting. He does not need any sustenance from his creation. He has no needs whatsoever. Totally and completely independent of any need or any want. لا تأخذه سنتون ولا نا. Look at this. He doesn't need any rest, and he doesn't sleep. To him belongs all of the dominion of the heavens and the earth. Look at this. And then he asks you a rhetorical question: Who is there? Who is there? That will come between him and his creation, except that he has to give them permission to do so in the first place. He has full knowledge of all things throughout the universe at all times, and you, you have no knowledge except that knowledge which he gives to you. And consider that he can take it at any time. His curse extends over the realm of the universe in all directions. His curse. What is a curse? Some of the companions of Muhammad, peace be upon him, asked, "Is this the throne of Almighty God? This curse? Curse like the one I'm sitting in?" A chair? Could it be his throne? They and he, look at this. He said no, no, no. He said this 
Percy is a footstool in front of the throne. This is to give you some idea of the amazing size, the amazing mass of this Kersey. And look at what it says. This Kersey compared to the throne as though you took a ring and you threw it into the desert. Think of what you just heard. A ring. A ring. Throw it. Throw it into the desert. Imagine yourself if you were to fly over a desert in a helicopter and throw a ring out and then come back tomorrow. Perhaps you'll get your camel caravan and you'll venture out into the desert and you'll look and you'll search for this ring and you'll never imagine you'll even find the same sand dune that you threw it into. The comparison of a ring thrown in the desert. And this is the comparison of this cursey in front of the arsh of Almighty Allah. And then that this cursey, even though tiny in front of the arsh, itself is like the desert and the universe becomes like the ring in front of this cursey. And my mind can't even imagine this kind of proportion. The ratio is beyond human comprehension. And then look, and he says, and he never gets weary of caring for all of it. And he is mighty and majestic above all things. And we're describing who? We're describing the creator, originator, and sustainer of all that exists. It's amazing. It's truly amazing. When somebody says, how big is Allah? You, you have to laugh. When somebody says, uh, well, where is God? You have to snicker. You have to think, what, what kind of question are you asking? Don't you know who you're talking about? This is why the beautiful Arabic expression clearly makes it known to you when it says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Because this is from the root kabara, kibr, which in human terms would be to be, have pride, be big. Kabara, big, but Akbar, the biggest, the greatest of all. Allah is Akbar. And this understanding is a part of the first of all of the facets in Islam to understand this sincerity. It goes beyond that. Of course, we can talk about the human understanding of sincerity. We can talk about how you are in front of the people and how you are when you're by yourself. We have spoke about it before, but let's think about it again. When I do something, an action, any action that I have, who have I really done it for? Have I done it so that people can observe? So that they can acknowledge, oh, look what Yusuf has done. Or did I do it for him? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, brought us a very clear understanding of this subject. When he told us about three, three people who would be brought forth on the Day of Judgment and then questioned about the bounties of Allah and the life that they were given and then asked, what did you do with that life? What have you done with your existence that Allah gave you? The favors he bestowed on you. Tell us, what have you done? And the first of them said, well, of course, I was a mighty general and I fought and strove in your cause and I was killed as a martyr in battle. All for you, Allah. And then he would be told, no. You did it so the people would say that you were a mighty warrior. And they said it. You've had your reward. And he would be dragged on his face into the fire of hell. Then the next one would be asked the same way. What have you done with the favor, this life that you've been given? What have you done with it? And he would say, oh, well, I, 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 learned, I learned your Quran. I, I taught. I was a teacher. I was, I was a knowledgeable person. All for you. And they'd be told, no, you lie. You did it 
so the people would say you were a scholar and they said it and then he would be dragged on his face into the fire of hell then the third would be brought and he would be asked the same and in reply he would say oh but I amassed great wealth and I gave it all for you in charity I did this and that all in sadaqah or charity for you. And he will be told, no, you lie. You only did it so the people would say, oh, what a generous man have we here. And they said it. And he would be dragged on his face into hell. Can we imagine this? When you pray, do you pray to be seen by the people? This was an accusation leveled at the Pharisees at the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, who said similar to them, you do it so the people can see it. When you fast, you want them to see. When you give alms and charity, you want the people to recognize. And the same we have in Islam. Why are you doing what you do? So the people can see? Or do you do it for him? One of the people who will be in the shade on the day of judgment when there is no shade except that that comes from a law. One of those people will be those who will give with the right hand. Even the left hand won't know what the right hand is doing. This is true sincerity. To do it from the heart and do it whether anybody knows it or not. We can achieve this sincerity We've done an amazing thing. We have a common enemy. All of us have an enemy. An enemy within us that is constantly trying to get us to do the wrong thing. To make us lose our reward with our creator. He's the one who tells us, oh, show off for this one. Let this person see you. Wait just a minute. Make sure they see you put your charity in this week. Oh, hold on a minute. Don't start your prayers yet. Oh, perhaps someone will see you praying. Or why bother? Why should I do it? Nobody's looking. The sincerity is the key. The key to one of the facets that we have. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said something that had such impact, yet small in words. So heavy is this statement that the biggest scholars of Islam throughout the centuries have begun their mighty works with this simple statement from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's narrated to us on the authority of one of his closest companions, Omar, radiallahu anhu, who tells us that Muhammad said, for sure, all of the actions are going to be judged according to the intentions. So if the intention is sincere and it's for the sake of Almighty God, then that's what the reward will be. But it's for anybody who is doing something for any worldly matter, such as marriage, or any other worldly thing, then this is what they'll have the reward of. There was a story of a man that they were making fun of one time because the nickname they gave him means the one who makes hijra for a certain woman. Hijra means to relocate. The story is that she was going to accept his offer for marriage. But she had one demand that he would have to relocate. He would have to leave his city and move to the city of Medina where Prophet Muhammad was. And he agreed to the terms so that he could get married to her. And some of the people that knew about it thought it was comical or funny because they said if he had made the intention to move to Medina, to the city of the prophet, to be with him, that would have been better for him than just to do it for the sake of marriage. 
every person is going to have the reward of what their intention was for based on two things. One, it has to be really and truly sincere for him. The second, it has to be in compliance with his rules and regulations that he set forth. You won't be able to just make up something and say, well, it's sincere, hope you like it. These things have been set forth for us in Islam to make this facet, this aspect, this beautiful part of the gem of Islam, something so beautiful, easy for us to understand, and it fits so nicely with the other facets that we'll be talking about. And may Allah forgive me, even now in this presentation, and I hope he will accept my sincerity and from all of those who are helping us to do this program about the facets of Islam. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Join us for the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about one of the many facets of Islam. It happens to be one that I'm very interested in myself and helped me to better understand the fullness, the richness, and the balance that we find in Islam. It's called rights. Everywhere we go, we hear people talking about rights. Human rights, women's rights, children's rights, and now grandparents' rights, animals' rights, plants' rights, so many rights. Everybody wants their rights. The right to vote the right to drive, the right to speak, the right to worship, the Bill of Rights. There are so many topics coming up about rights, rights, rights. I want my rights. But have you ever considered the other side? Because in Islam, we find something that makes it very clear what rights are really all about. Consider, if somebody said, I want my rights. Well, what's your rights? Well, my, my, my right to, to have this and to have that and to have so and so. But at the expense of someone else. I want the right to talk. But how? Because if I'm too loud or talk too much, what about the person who would like the right of silence? Where's the balance? Islam shows us real clear. Because Islam doesn't just talk about rights. As a matter of fact, Islam makes it very clear about rights and the opposite side, called limits. Because in Islam, for every right, there is a limit except for one. Let us talk about the first and the primary, above all, rights of this facet in Islam. The right of Almighty Allah the creator, the sustainer, the owner of the universe. What is his right on me, his right on you, his right on the creation? It is his right to be worshipped alone, without any partners, without any made-up deities or gods, without any false worship. That's his right. It's his right. And for that, there's no limit. As much as you would like to worship him, as much as you would like to say thank you to him, this is totally unlimited. Go ahead, enjoy yourself, and worship him. It's his right. What's the next right? The next right is the right of the prophet who comes to you with the message. For the people, 
who came after Adam, Abraham, and Moses, and David, and Solomon, and Jesus, peace be upon all of them, and Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Every one of the prophets has the right, the right to be followed, the right to be obeyed, the right to be considered as a messenger, as a prophet to their people. Allah sent these messengers and many prophets to many nations and finally sent the last prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, sent him to all the nations. So it's his right, it's his right to be obeyed because he is telling us how to worship Allah. How to give Allah his rights. To think about this a minute, you would realize, okay, this comes with understanding. If I lived before Muhammad, obviously I would have to give the rights, the right of prophethood, to whichever prophet came to me. If I lived at the time of Moses, obviously it would have had to him that I would have given this allegiance and this following to Moses, peace be upon him. Or perhaps if I had lived at the time of Abraham, Ibrahim as he's called in Arabic, I would have to give him this right to follow him, to honor him as my prophet, as the representative, as the messenger of Almighty God. So this is the next right with those limits. And after that, the scripture, the scripture itself, the scripture as it came to Moses, as it came to Jesus, as it came to Muhammad, peace be upon all of them, this scripture is from Almighty God. Therefore, this scripture has the right, the right of me to read, understand, and apply the correct teachings of scripture in my life. A lot of people, many folks in the world today, don't realize how much credence the Muslim gives to scripture. Not just Quran. As a matter of fact, it's a part and parcel of the Muslim belief that all scripture, all scripture that came from Allah is to be considered correct and holy. Whatever exists in its original form, the Muslim has no option but to say, we believe in it and all of it, and it's from our Lord. But then what about the rights in humans? Someone asked the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about this. They said, after Allah and his messenger, who has the most rights on me? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, your mother. Now this comes at a time in the Arabian desert when women had no rights whatsoever. Women were treated less than animals, less than dogs. Women were considered less even than human. And this at a time when the church was even having counsel as to whether or not a woman had a soul. So how could he make such a statement? Look at this statement. Your mother. Your mother has the most rights. An amazing statement for a man of his time and his place. The man said, and then who? He said, your mother. Huh? And then who? Your mother. And then your father. The rights in Islam, a most important facet is the rights of the parents. That if they become old in your time, that you give them the support, the care, the honor, the love, and the dignity. After all, the mother carried you in the womb for those nine long months and gave birth to you in trial and tribulation, pain and agony, gave birth till you came into the world and then cared for you and your needs and your wants and raised you up and taught you how to speak, taught you how to walk, taught you how to think, put your feet literally on the ground and set you on your way. Do you not owe her something? Do you not see the value of your parents in your life? And it's their right. It is their right that even if they get old and infirm, they're unable to care for themselves if they begin to lose their mental capacity, so much so that they don't even know who they are anymore, it's still their right that you take the responsibility.
to help them, care for them as they cared for you in the first place when you were but a babe. To the extent that the Quran tells us that if they're in this condition and you care for one or both of them in that age and that you don't even say, oof, no complaint from your lips, while well, you give them this service. And it's their right, but it has limits. What's the limit? Ah, your parents are to be obeyed, except, except if they have you to violate the rights above that. When the parents ask you to worship something other than Almighty Allah, then no, you can't, because you can't break the rights of Allah. If they have you to disobey the Prophet, then you cannot do this because it's his right over their right. So there are levels. And this is Islam teaching us the limits by understanding these levels, the priority of the rights, the rights of your body. And the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, taught us that the body has 360 joints. And each of them has the right of charity be given every day. 360 acts of charity a day is incumbent on you and I to fulfill the rights, the rights of the body. And he said, and this makes me feel better to know, that even a smile in the face of your brother is an act of charity. Ibtisam, smile. To care for the body that he's given us. To give the body proper nourishment. Proper rest. And proper care so that it can rest. And rebuild. And be strong. Exercise is an important part of having this body. If you don't take care of it, what will happen to it? And we know the results. Not to put anything into this body which will damage it and not to do things to the body to damage it. People will ask me, does Islam say anything about poking holes in the body, making, you know, these ring holes and, and tattooing and putting marks on the body? How about if I'd like to cut some pieces off? How about if I'd like to add some pieces on? How about if I'll get a tuck here, a nip there, do this, do that? What about that? How about if I pull out some hair over here or over there or stick some hair in over here or over there? What about that? Your body has rights. Now, if there's a need, and watch the limits. If there's a need, a legitimate need for something, then it becomes permissible to do so. But for some frivolous, silly sport or game, to put the body at risk, it's not permitted in Islam because the body itself has rights. And on the day of judgment, the body itself will testify against the person. The eyes will say, do you know what he made me look at? The ears will say, do you know what she made me listen to? The hands, do you know what he made me do? The feet, do you know where he took us? And the skin, even the skin, in will testify against the one who abuses the rights of the body. Rights. What about the rights of your relatives? Those close relatives. We've mentioned the parents, but what about the rights of your siblings, your brothers and your sisters, your cousins and your uncles and aunts, the grandmothers and grandfathers? The rights of your close family, do they have rights on you? The rights of your neighbors. And we're not just talking about passing by and giving them the salam and the smile. <laughs> yes, nice that you did that. But what about their real rights? The deep rights that when Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, He's not a believer. He's not a believer until he prefers for his brother over his own needs. The needs of my brother must come first over my own needs. Otherwise, he's not a believer. And when he 
peace be upon him, told us he's not a believer who fills his stomach and goes to bed at night while his neighbor's stomach remains empty. And someone asked him, O prophet of Allah, who are my neighbors? Who exactly? And he said, 40 in any direction. Right. Right. The rights of the neighbor. What about the rights of someone that's not from my faith? They're not of us. They're not Muslim. So, but look at this. In Islam, this right is clear. It's for everybody. Islam has taught us that every human being has come from the same source. That Allah, God Almighty, He's the one that created everybody, all from one man. And from Him, His mate. And from these two brought forth many men and women. And He made us different in our appearance, our looks, our colors, our shapes so that we would recognize each other. But they still have rights. A neighbor is a neighbor. A friend is a friend. Even in your business dealings, everybody has rights. And you must fulfill the people's rights. And if you thought, well, it's okay, I can cheat in business, everybody does it. Doesn't work. If you said, well, the person didn't even know. I just took a little bit out and sold it to them anyway. <laughs> I just shortchanged them, but they didn't know it. <laughs> but you violated their rights. How serious is it? It was said by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to give the analogy, the understanding, that on the day of judgment, a goat which had no horns, would get his rights on the goat that had horns. Meaning the goat with horns had poked him. Now the goat, the goat who had no horns, will get his rights on that day. When we make a mistake, when we've done some sin, we want to be forgiven. And we go to Allah. And that's the good thing to do. That's the right thing. And we say, oh Allah, forgive me. And he forgives. That's what he does. That's his name, the forgiver. Maybe you've performed hajj, the pilgrimage. Allah forgives everything. Maybe you entered into Islam by choice and then Allah forgives everything. Except for one thing. Allah does not forgive what you did to the people. That's between you and the people. So much so that he taught us that on the day of judgment, a person will be ready to go into paradise, but they won't be able to enter. They'll be stopped. Why? Because someone is waiting to take their rights. You've damaged somebody, and they want their rights. And you won't enter until they have been satisfied. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he asked a question. He asked a question to his companions, and he said, Do you know who the biggest losers, the... The poorest of all the people are. And they were saying, well, it's like uh, the poverty-stricken people. Is it the mesakin? Is it the, the, you know, the low people? He said, no. He said, the person that's the most poor is the one who comes on the day of judgment with a mountain of good deeds. But the people are in a long line to take their rights from this man. And as they come forward to get their rights from him, they're taking from his mountain of good deeds one by one by one until there's nothing left of the mountain of the deeds. Nothing. And the people are still in the queue. They're standing in the line waiting to get their rights. So much so that now he has nothing to give. So they begin to take their sins, their sayyat, their itham, and they're putting it onto him. And as a result of all these sins of others being put onto him, that he will enter into the fire of hell. And this is the biggest 
and the worst of all the losers. What about the rights of animals? Do animals have rights? And look what Islam has taught us 1,400 years ago about the woman who had committed some very bad sins, something really bad, something worthy of stoning, according to previous scripture. And yet this woman went into the well. She went down, climbed down to get water. And when she came out, she was drinking the water, refreshing herself, quenching her thirst. And then she saw a dog, a dog who was about to die, his tongue hanging out, trying to get some moisture dripping to the ground in front of her. And she said, oh, look at this poor dog. And she went back down, down into the well. She climbed down. And you know, this is something... If you think about it, to climb down in those wells, it was scary. Even for a man, how about for a woman? But she went back down in there and she took her sock or shoe and caught enough water and brought it back up and gave it to this dog out of the compassion to give this dog its rights, its right to drink. And for this act, Allah forgave her of everything. And how about another woman? Now this woman is a so-called righteous woman oh she prays and she fasts she gives charity she likes to oh look at me i'm doing this but then she has a cat a cat that she keeps confined and tied up and doesn't allow this poor cat to go about its business to collect anything to eat even bugs insects nothing as a result the cat dies and because of this, Allah did not accept her worship, did not accept all of these things that she was doing. And as a result, she went into the hellfire because she didn't give the rights to the cat. Plants, do they have rights? Trees, do they have rights? Insects and bugs, do they have rights? According to Islam, this beautiful facet of Islam, yes, every single thing has rights. The Muslim cannot arbitrarily just go out with a knife or a sword and start beating on trees and flowers and cutting them down for laughs. No, they can't. Nor can they kill the little insects and bugs just for something to do. Pulling the wings off of butterflies, stomping on the poor low ant, and all of these things are forbidden in Islam because you must give the rights to these creatures. All the creatures have their rights. The limits? Again, consider the limits. Yes, but sometimes you can't. You do the best you can, and then there are times when these animals or creatures would cause a big problem. A rabid dog, a cat that's got something wrong with it, that it could hurt the children. Ants that are taking over the house, obviously, Islam then permits what? The normal common sense that says, the rights of the humans are higher than the rights of the animals or these other creatures. So the balance is always there. Rights, but limits. And above all, to give Allah his rights. Because on the day of judgment, he's going to ask all of us about these rights. These rights. This facet of Islam. The rights of Allah. The rights of his books the rights of the prophets, the rights of the parents, the rights of the body, the rights of the siblings and the relatives, the rights of the near neighbors and friends, the rights of the community at large, and the rights of all creation. And each has its own balance, limits and rights. And this is one of the many beautiful aspects the facets of Islam. Islam, like any precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Join us now for Facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Yusuf Estes. I'll be your host for the next few minutes on Facets of Islam. And we're going to be talking about one of my favorite of all the facets of Islam. Freedom. 
Today, there's a lot of talk about freedom. We hear about freedom of the press. We hear about freedom of speech. We hear about the many freedoms that democracy offers or capitalism offers for us. The different societies and civilizations always promoting this idea of freedom, freedom, and we all want freedom. And who really would be the enemy to freedom? Doesn't even make sense. As a matter of fact, every single person wants freedom from something. Freedom from tyranny. Freedom from oppression. Freedom from poverty. Freedom from drugs. Freedom from abuse. Freedom from ignorance. Everyone's talking about freedom. 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 What's the opposite? What's the other side of freedom? Slavery. Yes, <laughs> I remember. Slavery, that's the opposite. Slavery to what? Slavery to humans. Slavery to work. Slavery to passion. Slavery to drugs. Slavery to one's own emotions. There's so many kinds of slavery. What does Islam say about this? What is the facet of freedom in Islam exactly? How do I understand that? If I study Islam even a little bit, I learned about this word slavery. And yet some people tell me, Islam is freedom. But I hear about this word slavery. In fact, I hear it over and over in the Quran itself saying, my slave. Even when it speaks about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself, he's not listed as a king in the Quran. He's not listed as an emperor in the Quran. He's not mentioned as some kind of a godhead or some kind of a great leader in Quran. In fact, Allah has called him a slave. Read chapter 17 of the Quran. Surah al Isra. Alhamdulillah, the praise to the one who has sent his servant, that's one translation, slave, another, abdihi, is clear. Abd, abd is a slave. Abdullah means the slave of Allah. I used to try to retranslate that as servant in the common usage of the language today. I said it's more appropriate really to say servant than it is to say slave because slave, it <laughs> brings us back a connotation of years gone by of this harsh slavery, of beating a person with a whip, of taking away their rights, of oppressing them. There's so much oppression when we think about slavery that I didn't want to use that when I give the translation, the meaning of the Quran to someone. But then I realized that no. Abdihi, this is Arabia, this is Arabic, this is what it says. It says slave, it's a slave. If you want to really be one of those that follows Islam, you're a slave. <laughs> Some of the enemies of the propagation of Islam, <laughs> they were telling people, you go to Islam, you're going to be a slave. In fact, that's what they're warning everybody about. Be afraid of Islam. It will enslave you. Stay away from the Muslims. They're promoting something that's calling for slavery. We don't want to be slaves. Little did they know. They already are. Because if you truly understand Islam, and you know the miracles of Islam, you know the truth of Islam, you know the proof of Islam, you know the reality of Islam, the rights in Islam, and the other facets that we're talking about constantly, and then you already know there really is only one God. And He owns everything. And there isn't anything out there except it all belongs to Him. In effect, the whole entire creation is His slave. It has to do what He wants it to do. There is no choice. The moon can't decide tomorrow, well, I don't think I'll just come up. I'll just stay where I'm at. The sun can't say, well, I don't want to glow today. I, I think I'll just, uh, you know, shoot off a little bit of heat here and there and that's it. No, the rain can't say, well, I don't want to fall today. I'll just go up. Everything is under the command of Allah. 
always. Now, if you understood that, then you should understand that even we today, whether we choose to or not, are still only going to do what he wills for us to do. But if we do so by choice, if we give in and we do what we've been talking about in the past, if we give the sincerity to him, if we give the peace and we give the commitment, the surrender, the obedience to him that's due to him, if we follow, and it's in the books, uh, please, Go back and read. See what it says in the books before. Does it or does it not command the followers? Or is it just called the Ten Suggestions? There's only one king, the owner, the sovereign, and he has given a clear commandment to all to worship him alone without any partners, no gods beside him. So if I do that, I cannot help except be his slave. And if you said, no, I've got it. We've got the proof on you Muslims. You have said it, and we got you. It's in your own show. You just said it, and we did. But listen, if you're not a slave to your creator, then you're a slave to something he created. Either you're a slave to someone or something, or a slave to your own passions, lusts, and desires. You are a slave to the substances that you're taking into your body every day. You're a slave to the things around you, the things that you look to to try to get peace really are enslaving you. The things that you turn to to get the satisfaction, to get the emotion. These are enslaving you. Smoking, tobacco, alcohol, drinking, drugs, pornography, violence, ownership. All of these things enslave. When a person needs from this creation, he's never going to be fulfilled. Look what Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, said. If the son of Adam had a valley full of gold, he'd want another just like it. How could that be? What would you do if you had a valley full of gold? <laughs> what would you do with it? Stop and think of this tremendous statement that's being made here. A valley of gold. You couldn't even hide it from anybody, could you? It's there. It's a gold valley. Wow. And now what will you do with it? And where will you keep it? In fact, if you had all the gold of the earth, and stop and think about this, if you had all the gold of the earth, then what benefit would it be? Because you couldn't buy anything. Because if you tried to buy it, then you wouldn't have all the gold of the earth anymore, would you? Would you? What good was it? No. This gold will not bring you freedom. The wealth is not going to bring you the freedom. What about fame? That everywhere you go, people say, Oh, look who it is. It's so-and-so. Can we have your autograph? Isn't it nice? Oh, and waving. And... But would that really bring you freedom? In fact, if you need that, <laughs> then you need the people to recognize you to get this. So there's no benefit in that. There's not going to be any freedom come to you from any of these substances that you take either because actually you become a slave to it. First time a person smokes a cigarette. First time. Does what? Makes it so it's easy to do it the second time. There's no reason not to do it the second time. The big reason was not to do something bad the first time because the second time, well, I already did it once. Or twice, or three, or four. And then the nicotine sets in and starts working in the lungs, in the nervous system. And in order to get any kind of rest, any kind of, of relaxation at all, I can't stop this pain, the agony, I've got to have another cigarette. Ah, oh, the freedom of smoking. Ah, freedom? You just gave away your lung. You just gave away your health. You just gave cancer to your children that you love and they didn't even smoke. They were in the room with you and got the cancer. 
What kind of freedom is that? And when we talk about the dependency on alcohol, and again, the first time, oh, well, who is this? I drive, oh, yeah, it tastes terrible, but I feel stupid. <laughs> and then what? The second time, oh, I've had it before. Ho, 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 look at me. Oh, I'm drinking some alcohol. And then again, and again, until the dependency comes. Because now I can't have any fun unless I'm loaded. Freedom. Drugs. Today, some of the drugs are so horrible, so deadly, that a person only needs to take it once. And they don't have to worry about taking it again because they're dead. That's freedom. That's freedom. That's slavery. Freedom. Let's talk about freedom to dress. That a person can dress any way they like. Isn't that a freedom? But wait a minute. Are you talking about the freedom to dress or the freedom to undress? Think about that. What? What's the need inside of you? What's this slavery going on in your head that you're locked in on, that you have to do something so people will like you? So maybe people will like me if I show parts of my body. Wow, look at that. The more I show, the more they like. What is that? And where will you be 50 years from now? Huh? Huh? Slavery or freedom? Now when we talk about it, some people talk about the freedom of speech. Have you heard this one? The freedom of speech? We've all heard freedom of speech. A journalist has the freedom of speech. He can write as he likes. I attended a special conference in a country that had been insulting Islam in a horrible way. They did a lovely conference. They brought the journalists forward. And they took beautiful care of these people, these journalists and photojournalists. They fed them. They took time to educate them. They gave them anything they needed in the way of proper knowledge to see what is true Islam and share with them. Men and women, Muslims from around the world, PhDs in various subjects, world leaders and politicians who are Muslims came and spoke and shared and shook hands and laughed and we were together and it seemed so lovely. It seemed like we had cleared up a lot of misunderstandings and then in the paper the next day those same people put the worst kind of statements, twisted everything around and even lied boldly in headlines. And they took so many pictures waiting to get the right, the right look, you know? Like... People are smiling and laughing, having a good time. But maybe somebody would sneeze. Achoo! Get, get that right there. Ew, look at that guy. Ooh, how mean he looks. They did that. When I saw the papers, I was so distraught. I was so upset. I was fit to be tired. How could somebody do this? And when I began to complain, I said, this is an abomination against true journalism. How could anyone do something like this? Do you know what they said? They said, sir, this is true freedom. Freedom of speech. Freedom of the press. Freedom. I said, stop. You're talking about the freedom to lie. And they stopped cold right there and turned away. The fact, the fact is... When you are really on freedom, you're a servant and slave to the Almighty. Then he makes everything free to you. It's all free to you. And listen to this, this beautiful teaching of Islam about true freedom. You as a human being, as a Muslim who has surrendered, and that's what Muslim means. It means to do Islam, to surrender, submit, obey in sincerity and peace, the Almighty. You're free to do that. And when you do, you become a Mu-Islam. One who Islams is called a Muslim. Mu-Islam. That's freedom. That's real freedom. And if you said, well, I don't see that. 
Well, that's because you didn't understand it. You didn't try it. Because according to Islam, as a Muslim, you're free to do anything in this life. Anything you would like to do, except those things which he, he alone has forbidden you to do. Other than that, you're free to do as you like, except what you find evidence of prohibition. He forbids you to worship other than him. He forbids you to dishonor your parents. He forbids you to take the innocent life. He forbids you to lie and to cheat and to steal. And he forbids you against these horrible acts, these oppressive acts of sex outside of marriage. He forbids you that you oppress others and to take their rights away. But other than that, you're free. You're free to do as you like, except what's forbidden. When it comes to worship, when it comes to worship, that is where you'll find the biggest restriction because everything is forbidden. Everything is forbidden to do in worship except that which you find evidence to do. This you're free to do according to the way that you've been instructed. This is how Islam works. Everything in the life, everything in the material existence called Hayat dunya in the Arabiya, this you're free to do. Enjoy anything except what's forbidden. In worship, everything's forbidden except that which has specifically been ordained for you to do. What a beautiful balance. And if you take advantage of this, and you understand this, and you give up this life for him, become his slave, then all the rest of the world will open up to you. And you'll take the maximum benefit here, the maximum benefit on the day of judgment, and the maximum benefit in the next life, in the paradise. Yeah, that's a good deal. That's a real good deal. Freedom. I want what will make me the happiest. Because how do I even know what freedom is if there's no basic set of instruction for me? If there's nothing for me to balance, for me to understand? I need something to show me what is freedom anyway. Because those newspapers, the media, television, magazines, and all these other forms of publicity are telling me this is freedom. And that's freedom. And something else is freedom. But when I really investigate it, I find that, no, these people are enslaving me. The very things that they're telling me are freedom are the things that enslave me. Them. Look at it. They're the ones who are coming up with ideas of what kind of clothes you have to have, what kind of car you have to have, what kind of house you have to have, what kind of job you have to have, what type of education you must to have. All of the things that they're showing me that I have to have in order to have this freedom. If I don't have those things, according to them, I'm not free. If I don't look a certain way, oh, I must buy makeup. Or maybe I need plastic surgery so somebody can alter the way I look. So that I'm what? I'm what they said is free. Does this make sense? Or can I just be me? What about the freedom to be me? What about the freedom to enjoy the life that my Almighty gave me? What about the freedom to express my love and my devotion to Him? What about the freedom to follow what He has ordained for me to do? Can I not have that freedom? My grandfathers and their grandfathers and their grandfathers hundreds of years ago fought fought hard for their freedom in Spain. And then they migrated for freedom into England and fought there and then went to the New World and fought there for freedom, always saying they were fighting for freedom. But when they went into the New World, there were people already living there and they fought against them and claimed that they were doing it in freedom and they enslaved them. And rounded them all up into groups or tribes and told them, this is where we want you to be and this will be your freedom and our freedom. 
And then they broke away from England and fought them and said, we're fighting for freedom. 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 And then they began to fight themselves. Brothers against brothers, cousins against cousins, uncles, nephews, their own relatives, killing each other over freedom. They said, we're fighting for the right for people to be free. The other side said, we're fighting for the right to be free from your oppression. We want to secede our states from you guys. So we want freedom. And the other guy said, we want freedom. And everybody killed each other in the name of freedom. And when they were all done killing everybody, they had a resolution. And they said, we have freedom now. A hundred years after that, people were still treated like slaves. And where's the freedom? And even today, and I've worked in the prison systems for a long time, I know for a fact, we're a long way from freedom. In fact, the human being in his wildest imagination, can never really, really conceive and implement the real freedom. Because there will always be somebody who wants to put somebody else into slavery of some kind. It's only the Creator Himself who can give us the true, real, lasting freedom. To be a slave in this life to the Almighty God is the way to achieve the real freedom of the next life. And that is the perspective and that facet of freedom in Islam. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. I'm your host Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about one of the many facets of Islam. The facet that we will speak about now is the one called logic. Plain old common sense. I recall some years ago, I was sitting with friends and we were discussing the matter of life. Where did we come from? How did we get here? What's the purpose of life? And then what would be the logic behind it all? And we didn't seem to be able to come up with any kind of answers. I read books of philosophy and sat with some people that were pretty smart in a lot of areas, in various sciences and disciplines. But it wasn't until I had the opportunity to sit with the scholars and teachers of Islam that I began to see the real logic, the deep logic behind so many things. For instance, where did everything come from? Is there a common source? Is there intelligence behind everything? Now today, scientists tell us that there are certain things that have just basically popped up in creation that they are unable to account for. Things that do not have a source that they came or evolved from. In other words, it appears that there is something called creation instead of just evolution. So much so that those scientists that adhere to that notion have come up with a nomenclature or name for it they call it ID for intelligent design. They're afraid to go any further than that, afraid to say there might be a God, but they are committed to the idea that there's something intelligent out there, some force, some thinking entity that has caused things to come about. Of course, as soon as they say that, those who want to hold fast to the idea of atheism those who would like to deny any kind of creator, those who would like to continue to promote this so-called theory of evolution, those folks are going to be very much against these guys with their ID or intelligent design. 
and they're going to say, that's not logical. But on the other hand, if you really think about it, what is logic? Think, if you acknowledge that there is a system, then you have to acknowledge that it came from somewhere. Things do not come about in organized fashion simply by chance. Let us consider that if you take a drinking glass and throw it down on the cement, it will break or shatter into many different parts. If you take another glass just like it and throw it down the same way, it will also break, but not in the same way, not with the same parts. And if you did that again and again and again, you will just see a lot of broken glass. But never, not one time out of millions, if you throw the glass down, will it ever form little small drinking glasses. Never. And by this same token, if you consider a junkyard, metal salvage, and a big wind or tornado comes through and picks up this metal and starts to twist it around and throw it around and move it and shape it and reshape it, never in the history of the universe would it occur that all of this metal would come down and form a brand new automobile with a motor running, would it? Never. And anybody who said so, you would just laugh at them. And if I ask you something as simple as the chair that I'm sitting in, where did it come from? And you'd say, well, of course it came from a manufacturer that makes chairs. It's a stupid question. But you agree it had to come from somewhere. Someone had to shape it. Yes. When you see an automobile pass by, you immediately identify, is this Mercedes? Is this Chevrolet? Is this Nissan? Is this Toyota? And they have emblems that tell you, and you can identify them immediately, yes? Using the logic. We have to look now to the universe and see. Look to the macro, the large. Look at, look at the heavens. Look all the way out as far as you can see. Use your telescope and observe those planets. Look to those stars. Look at the moon and think. And where did it come from? And why is it in this, this movement? We see cycles. We see everything in cycles. And then when we take the microscope and we look again, and how do the molecules come together? How are they formed? What do they tell us about the atom? How is the shape of the atom? Is it spheres surrounded by spheres? Are they in elliptical orbits? Is there a proton, a neutron, an electron? And are they moving? Why? How? Who did it? And why is it that under the microscope, I see things that are similar to what I see when I look under the telescope? And why is it that I am unable to see either one of those without optical assistance? Hmm? Is it possible that the creator of all of this has put it all together in a logical way so that the human being could look and observe? If the answer is possibly yes, then look to the Quran. Look to the Quran and see what the speech, that's what Quran means, speech of Allah, the recitation. See what it says. Because in fact, it asks you and asks me to consider, to think, to examine. Look to the heavens, it says. It even says that Allah, the creator of everything, is going to show signs, signs on the furthest horizons and within our own selves, and he'll show proofs. So this would be logic. I want to specifically now come to one of the logics that most impressed me quite by accident and how it came about. It's called sunnah. Sunnah in the Arabic language means the way that is something is done. The moon moves a certain way. It twists and turns and goes in its orbit. The sun has an orbit that it is in. The earth is in an orbit around the sun. And all of this is called sunnah, the way that something is done. 
But when it comes to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he also had things that he did in a certain way. Things that he said, things that he did, things that he approved of or disapproved of by his actions or being silent about it. All of that is called his way or his sunnah. One night as I was riding home, I became very tired. My little daughter was with me and she turned the radio on really loud to wake up her daddy. You know, daddy, stay awake. Daddy, stay awake. I remember saying that. And she turned on the radio real loud. And as she turned it on, I heard the voice come over the radio and he said, always sit down when you eat or drink. So who's that? Who said that? That's in Islam. Is that a Muslim? Always sit down when you eat or drink. Never stand while you eat or drink because of the damage that it does to the various organs in the body. What is this about? It was a doctor, a surgeon, who was explaining the dangers of standing while you eat or drink. Now this was well known to Prophet Muhammad and his companions, peace be upon him, centuries ago, 1,400 years ago, that he was showing this exact same thing. Sit down when you eat or drink. But listen to what the doctor's telling us. The damage that is done to the esophagus, the damage that is done here in the lining and down what they call the hiatal hernia, which develops for people, and they get this burning and acid reflux that comes, the tearing of the stomach wall, the damage to the gallbladder, to the kidneys, to the stomach and to the bowel even, all of the operations that this doctor was describing that could be easily prevented if a person would only sit down when they eat or drink. There was a report that was issued in Washington, D.C., and in the medical journals just a few years ago, dealing with the subject of the number of people who are affected and infected with herpes and with this hepatitis, which is being spread around simply because people are communicating the disease one to the other and largely because they're not staying clean. Now, in the West, we have signs in the facility, in the toilet area, telling the employees of each of the places, restaurants, fast food chains, wash your hands before you return to work. Telling them once you use the toilet, wash your hands. Yet they found that more than 70% of the employees do not obey this sign. How many? More than 70% are not washing their hands and they're having this fecal matter or urine and filth on their hands and they go right back into the kitchen and start preparing your food. When they examine closely the everyday tools and things that are used around an office and they take samples and take it to the laboratory to find out why so many employees are becoming sick and not going into work. Too many days off. The insurance companies don't like that because they have to pay for the employees who are not there. What they discovered was that on the telephone, on the keyboards of the computers, and on the desktops, books, pencils and pens, there is debris that's being left there by the hands of the people who are going into the toilet, who are dealing in different kinds of filth, and then not washing their hands and bringing it out, sneezing, coughing, and these things, and putting it right out there and sharing it with each other. All of this was mentioned in the Sunnah 1400 years ago. Let us think. Now, we're talking about eating. Let's go to the next thing, what to eat. We find in previous scriptures, in the Old Testament, for instance, the order for people not to eat pork. I remember in the 1950s, 
<laughs> the people who argued against it and said, oh, that was back then. They didn't have refrigeration. Now we have good refrigerators and freezers. And we know now that that's the problem is that the meat just needs to be quickly refrigerated. And if we can just do that, then it'll be fine. In the late 1950s, they discovered it didn't work. There were other things coming out of this meat, and refrigeration didn't cure everything. 1960s, ah, now we've got a new way to deal with it. We're going to put some chemicals in the meat. Late 1960s, whoops, that didn't work. I have to try something else. Since then, they've done what they call flash freeze. Freeze it, you know, and now that should work. But yet when they thaw it out, here comes a new set of bacteria or worms and things that they have to deal with. They've even gone to the extent of doing something with radiation, radiation treatment. Can you imagine making the pig radioactive? Can you imagine glow-in-the-dark pig meat? I don't know. But this is the kind of condition that we're in when people just don't seem to want to catch on. You were told by your creator. You were told by the one who made you and I and the pig. He made us and he told us what to do. Now, of course, we have this in Islam as well. In the Quran, there's the clear order for the believers to stay away from the laham khanzir. Laham is flesh, khanzir means pig meat. And then somebody might say, well, okay, but that's just the flesh. We could eat the skin maybe, or we could maybe, you know, eat the feet of him. You know, they boil the pig's feet. Or maybe we could eat his ears, maybe because there's no flesh in the ear. And they start with all these arguments. Are you crazy? What is the matter with you? Haven't you understood? Here, you have an order from your creator, the one who manufactured us, okay? He's giving you clear instruction. Here's your book. Here's the owner's manual. Don't do it. And you're trying to find ways around it. What about alcohol? Again, for centuries we've been told... Don't consume alcohol. It says in the Quran, more or less the meaning of it is that there are benefits, okay, but there's damage, and the damage far outweighs any benefit you're ever going to get out of the alcohol. So leave it. Do not drink it. Don't drink alcohol. Today they can show you scientifically, ah, well, the, the chemical reaction inside the human being, the dependency on alcohol, there is something that's addictive within there, and some people are unable to get away from the addiction when they get into alcohol. They become alcoholics, and there's nothing they can do about it. How come we couldn't just take what it said? Don't do it. Now we've talked about putting food in and the kind of food to stay away from. What about after you've eaten it, after you've digested the food? The food's got to come out. The liquid's got to come out. Yes? So... Where do we find the answer on how to relieve ourselves properly according to the manufacturer's instruction, meaning the creator? What is the logic? Well, the logic would tell a person, well, if I have to go, I have to go, whatever. It doesn't matter when, where, how, just so I get relief from my problem. But actually, we know from the sunnah, the way of Muhammad, peace be upon him, that there is a time, a place, and a way for a person to do all of this. And it's spelled out real clear in Islam. First is to go far from where the people are. Of course, we know now why. But back then, it was just a matter of perhaps smell or something like that. There's a lot more to it. Go far from the people and not to contaminate the drinking water. And this was something that they made a big emphasis on. They didn't contaminate their drinking water or the water of the livestock. And for the men and women both, they were told to sit down. To sit. Because when you sit, you're following the sunnah. This is the logic. Okay? But then if a person said, well, I don't see why today. But now we find, again, we go to our scientists, and they're telling us, oh, the one who stands and tries to relieve themselves is causing damage and again, just as we learned about what happens when you eat and stand, also when you relieve and stand, it can cause problems, and the list goes on. But suffice to say, the proper way for both male and female is to sit while they relieve themselves. And when they finish, and now today to be sophisticated, to be up to date, of course, 
you will use paper to clean yourself. And this is considered very hygienic. But in fact, if you were to go to the doctors, if you were to go to the hospital, and there was going to be an operation performed on your body, would they wipe you down with paper? Or do they wipe you down with some type of solution? And do they use like alcohol to clean you and things like that? And the answer is yes, they do. They are cleaning you with liquid. They're washing you with a liquid soap. Why aren't they using paper? Well, the doctor will tell you right away, it leaves debris. It leaves particles of the paper itself. And it doesn't get you clean. And when the doctor gets ready to do the surgery, does he wipe his hands with paper or does he wash? And the answer is he washes. He doesn't even dry his hands on any towel because he doesn't want to pick up any germs. Is that true or false? And the answer is yes. So if you understand that, how come you can't understand that what you were told in the logic of the Sunnah is for you, me, and for all times? Let's take one more example and just think about it. Suppose, suppose you went out to pick up the Sunday paper. You're out here, I'm going to get the Sunday paper today. You reach down to pick up the paper out in the yard, you know, and you grab it. And oh my goodness, somebody's dog has passed by and done something in the yard. Now I have it on my hand. Well, remember what we told you in the first place? You're supposed to have used your left hand, weren't you? But you didn't. You reached with the right to pick something up out of the dirt. All right, let's say I picked it up with the left hand, all right? I still have the stuff on there. Am I going to take part of the paper and wipe it? Or am I going to go to the faucet, turn it on, and wash it off? And the answer is known to you and I both. You're going to use water to wash it off. The water is the answer. And that's what was told to us 1,400 years ago. The logic is there. So many things that as I began to learn about this thing called sunnah, it's just practical application. But check this out. And if this doesn't get you, I, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. In Spain, during the heyday of Islam, when the real science was being brought there a thousand years ago, when people were really thinking, reflecting, and teaching, and they were into astronomy, geology, hydrology, and understanding how the water cycles work, many of the great sciences and disciplines were being developed at that time. And people traveled from all over the world, from Europe especially, to come and to be educated here. But at that time, it was called the Dark Ages. And there was the Black Plague. And the people were suffering and dying en masse all through Europe. But this was not happening amongst the Muslims. The Muslims were free from that. And even when the Europeans came and brought their plague with them, they would even die. But the Muslims didn't catch it. It didn't spread. Now today, they can explain it to you real easy. They're, well, that's pretty simple. The Muslims were washing themselves at least five times a day. They were cleaning themselves the way a surgeon does today. They ate with their right, not with the left. So they didn't pick up this infectious diseases. And when they eliminated, they had a certain place and a way, and they washed everything away with water, just as we use the modern-day toilets. Washing it away. All of this was 1,400 years ago. That's where it started. A thousand years ago, we see what happened in Spain. And none of them ever got it. In fact, they showed the people of Europe what to do to cure their problem. And they took it all from what? The logic. The facet of Islam called logic. Now, it's not the logic of you and I. And it's not the logic of the scientists that I'm talking about. It's the logic of the creator who knew what he created in the first place. And when he gives us something as beautiful and as simple to use as something called Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi peace be upon him, then what is stopping us from using our logic to recognize, hey, this is something that I need for me. It's as simple as that, isn't it? Simple as that. Simple logic. Here we have the example in front of us. We know that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last messenger for all human beings, for all time. And he's telling us, do this, don't do that. Follow this way. Follow this 
Sunnah. So this is the logic of the Sunnah. One of the many beautiful aspects of Islam. Islam, like any precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Let's explore the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. And for the next few minutes, we're going the many This particular facet is simple. Simple. That's the facet. And that's how simple it is. We're going to be talking about the simplicity and straightforwardness of the presentation of Islam itself. Let's begin by discovering what the word means. It's an Arabic word, so it's proper then to go to the Arabic dictionary and look it up and say, what is this word? Where does it come from? What does this mean? The simple understanding is that it comes from a root, salama. And when it reaches this perfected state, of Islam, it has so many beautiful words in it. Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. And all of these together imply a relationship between two entities, one being the dominant and the other being the one subjugated. The one is the master and the one is the slave. Because when there is surrender and submission and obedience and, of course, sincerity and peace, it implies immediately the simple relationship between the Creator and that which He has created. We can easily test it with a simple formula. Is this the relationship between Almighty God and the universe? According to Islam, yes. All of creation submits to the owner, to the creator and the sustainer. Everything, the sun, the moon, the earth, the mountains, rivers, streams, trees, flowers, bees, birds, all are in submission and obedience. To the one creator. That's the meaning of the word. It's as simple as that. What's really beautiful too. Is the concept. The simple understanding of. Who the God is. God is one. No discussion is really needed. We don't have to sit and argue. Or discuss. Or go into lengths. Of how to prove that. This or that. We just say one. God. Allah is one. That's very simple. A child can understand it. A simple person can understand it. God is one. His will is to be obeyed. And if you do so, then you're doing Islam. In the Arabic language, the one who performs the action or the verb would be the Mu Islam, because unlike English, which uses the two letter ER of a verb to give the indication of who's performing it, like walk, er, talk, er, think, er, stink, er, <laughs> you see that you have this suffix, ER. Arabia, you have a prefix before the action to show you who's doing it. And likewise, if someone is doing Islam, he's a mu Islam, Muslim. The one who recognizes that there really is one God and they want to do God's will, obeying Him, then they are a mu Islam. Another simple and beautiful point about this facet is 
that it is for all times. It means, then, from the very beginning, this would still be applicable. Adam could easily be called a Muslim because he recognized there's one God. And he tried to do what God wanted him to do. That would then indicate that each and every one of all of the prophets were simply doing God's will, communicating a message to their people and showing them what it was that the God, the one God, wanted them to do. So, in this way, we would say each of them were Muslim. Islam, Tasliman, all of these words coming from the same root. Surrender, give up, do what he wants you to do. Very simple message. Now we've spoken a little bit about the word and what comes from it. We've talked about the creation being in this condition and also that each one of us could easily be a Muslim. Even if you don't know Arabic, even if you've never heard of the Quran, maybe somebody never heard of Muhammad, although today that's highly unlikely, it's still... If that would be the situation, all that counts is this. He knows everything. He knows what's in the heart of every single soul because he created them. Therefore, whoever recognizes there must be a God and I want to do what he wants me to do, and they try their best, they could be considered as one who has understood this simple message and is in the will of God as a Mu-Islam, Muslim. Some of the other beautiful, simple facets come immediately after this because we recognize that it's impossible to consider any other way to be correct because if there is a God and if he has a will and if he has something that he wants done, then it's only logical that his way would be the only way. His way is the only acceptable way. Therefore, whatever he wants, this should be what we would want as well. We wouldn't need to make up something. In fact, it wouldn't be simple anymore. If we begin to make things complex and make it difficult, we would be getting away from the very essence of the beauty of this whole word, this Islam, which, by the way, also gives this connotation of being complete and whole. Simple, isn't it? It makes you feel like, why didn't I think of that before? It is so simple. The beauty of this deen or way of Islam is that it's so simple. No matter what the condition of the person is, he could still be in Islam. Let us take, for instance, some of the actions that are required of the Muslim. First is to pronounce their belief in God. A Muslim needs to declare, I bear witness, there's none to worship except Almighty God, and I bear witness to the prophet who brought me the message, which at the time of Abraham would have been Abraham. At the time of Moses, it would have been Moses. At the time of Jesus the Christ, then obviously it would have been him. And at the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and those who follow after, then of course that would be their prophet. So they would say, Ashadu la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there's none to worship except Allah. Wa ashadu Muhammadin abduhu rasul. And I bear witness Muhammad is his servant and his messenger to me. The next thing after that is to perform what's called salawat, the prayers, the ritualistic standing, bowing, prostrating, sitting and praying toward a certain direction. But what if the person didn't know the direction? Would that mean then that he couldn't pray? And if he didn't pray, then would he still be a Muslim? Well, in the case of the direction, he takes his best educated guess and performs his prayer. There's another requirement, though. He's supposed to wash before he prays. What if there's no water available? And we know from Islam that it's simple, that he can use a little talc or dust and just dust his hands, his face, and perform his prayers. 
because it's very simple. Very simple. I stay away from the word easy, though, because I remember when I first came to Islam, some of the Muslims told me, how easy is Islam? <laughs> I said, well, it may be simple, but I'm not going to say easy, because definitely along the way there are going to be things that arise that cause a person to have to work, to do things, and experience things, and that's all a part of Islam. But if a person understands that the beauty here is the simplicity, all he has to do is as much as he can do, and that's all that's required. So when the water's not available, he would use the dust. If he's not able to stand in his prayer, he would sit. As I'm sitting here, I could perform my prayers right here. In fact, I've had to do that sometimes. And if a person is ill, if they're uh, in a certain situation where they're unable to stand, then they're able to sit and perform their prayers. Another important part of being a Muslim is fasting the month of Ramadan. But what if a person's not able to fast? They need to take medicines. What if there's something wrong with their stomach that they're not able to be away from food that long? What if, okay, in this case, they can make up for it simply by waiting at a time when they are able to make up those days that they missed, or if they can't ever do it, then they can simply feed the people who are fasting and get the same reward. Hajj this is another part of Islam. The pilgrimage, a person travels to Mecca once in the life. But what if they're unable to do so? What if they can't go? Some people might be incarcerated in a prison or something. They couldn't get away. They couldn't go. Or perhaps they're incapacitated some other way, unable to travel. Then the fact that they have the intention alone is sufficient for them. Many times we see things that happen in life that we're just physically unable to do the things that we desire to do. But if it's necessary to be a part of Islam, there's always these conditions. In Arabic, there's something called durura. Durura means that there is a difficulty. There is something that's an obstruction, something that is not normal. And then with that comes another word, ruksa. Well, this is a concession or a permission that a person is allowed then to do something in its stead. An example here, when a person's traveling, it's difficult to perform their prayers according to the schedule because one of the things when you're traveling in an airplane, you're going through too many time zones too fast. Well, you can combine the prayers together and shorten them. And you can do it according to the time that makes it easy for you to work it out. All of these things are part of the simplicity and the wholeness of Islam. So these books or scriptures that came with them are also simple to understand. Even today, we have the Quran in the Arabic language. And it's very simple for a person to spend a little time to learn the Arabic and begin to read. Although the Arabic language is very big, massive, powerful, it's still simple to begin and learn. The very easy teaching of the Arabic language makes it simple to get started. I personally was able to learn the basic of Arabic language in only six weeks and able to understand it within a few months. What we mean by this word simple is that every person has the opportunity regardless of their mentality, to comprehend and put into their light this beautiful Islam, this submission and surrender to the will of the one, the one God. Now, coming back to this part of the simple message, this facet of Islam, the oneness of God, many books, even volumes, perhaps even libraries, have dealt with what is called the Tawheed in Islam. The Tawheed is usually translated to English as monotheism. However, it's simpler than that if you want to go to the Arabic because it comes from the word Wahid. Tawheed comes from Wahid. And Wahid means one, simply one. The oneness 
of the God. See how simple it is. Each thing that we talk about becomes so simple. The words that are used in Arabic to represent the concepts and the teaching, when you look to them, you realize it's not that difficult. It's simple. The parables used in the Quran to help us to understand, again, are simple. The comparisons that we find, again, are simple. When Allah asks us to think, He asks you to look at things like mountains. That's pretty simple to do. Consider rivers. That's easy to do. Talks to us about things that are within our own hands, about ourselves, about our feelings, our emotions. Simple. Keeping it simple and straightforward. And all of this is just one facet of the many beautiful facets in Islam. When we talk about our relationship with others, again, in Islam, it's simple. Put the concerns and needs of the others in front of your own concerns and needs. Don't put yourself first. Put others first. Simple as that. And then you have grasped a very important part of Islam. And that is your relationship with other people. Because stop and think. If I'm trying to take care of someone else, they're going to appreciate that a lot more than if I'm in front of them trying to take care of myself and ignoring their needs. So again, it's simple. Each and every one of the facets that we've been presenting in our series, when you think about it, is really simple. And all of it together makes up the whole, the whole of the gem. And it's all held together in a real simple and beautiful way. Each piece fitting right beside the other piece and making it so that when you reflect and you think, it's simple. One of the things that we find in the Quran is that Allah constantly asks us to think, to reflect, to consider, to compare. He just asks you to think about it. I remember when I first started learning some of the words in the Quran, that I realize there's patterns within the Quran. And when I see a certain pattern, I can almost guess what's going to come up next. And it's simple. Anytime it's talking about the people who disbelieve, you find the same structure of words. It's simple. When I find about those who do believe, again, there's a pattern. And it all simply comes together. And you understand that those who believe and do good works will receive appropriate rewards for that. Those who disbelieve and do evil, will be punished. That's simple, isn't it? What a concept. There's no sin that's carried forward from one person to another. Another simple concept. If you did something, you're responsible. The people around you, if they didn't have anything to do with it, why would they be responsible? Why would your children inherit sin from you? In fact, in Islam, it's simple. You could be the best person, even though your parents could be evil, or your children could be bad, but still you would be rewarded according to what you did, or punished for any evil. There's a day of judgment. This is something else, very beautiful and simple in Islam. Each and every person will have to stand before their Creator, before their Lord, and account for what they have done. This makes sense. It's simple. It also gives the balance that we need to know. That why? Why this person, he did this and he did that and he wasn't punished in this life. Another person who did so many good things, but look, they suffered in this life. But then on the day of judgment, all of these things come out. And then the one who had the hard life, the difficulty, yet they persevered, they were good. And of course they submitted to God on his terms this person would be rewarded. The other one, who did the evil, did the bad, didn't submit, denied, denied the favors of his Lord, then in the next life, he would suffer. Well, that makes sense. So now we start to begin to see other facets. We start seeing a facet called balance. We see another one that's called justice. We see other facets that come from this as well. And we understand now with this simplicity 
how it leads to its next door neighbor, a facet called peace. Because when there's simplicity and I can relax and say, yes, that makes sense, and then it does what? It allows my brain to be in peace. Another facet. All these facets working together, working together, bringing about a wholeness, a full and complete gem. And again, let's go back and look at the word. Islam also has this connotation of a wholeness, a completeness that comes along with the surrender, the submission, the obedience, the sincerity, and the peace. Each of these, another facet, major facets, all being connected together with this simplicity. So simplicity, the many facets in Islam. If we relax our minds and our hearts and we just start to reflect on the very simplest things of life, reflect and then compare to what's being taught by the Creator Himself, go to His book and read it and think, what did He say? And then look about you and see, isn't that right? Isn't that simple? Isn't that clear? There was an occasion that happened to one of the prophets, the prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, that the people were worshiping these false gods, statues, and so on. And he went in to their temple when they weren't there and destroyed all of them with a big hammer. He left the hammer by the biggest of their statues, their big god. Then when he went away, the people came in and found all the destruction that had happened. And they were so upset and they said, oh, who did this? And they called him, because they'd heard he was upset with their gods. They called him, and he came and he looked. They said, what do you say about this? Look about you. What do you see? What do you say? He said, why are you asking me? Why don't you ask the big god that you've got over there, that big statue? He's the one with the hammer. Ask him. And they were shocked. They said, ask him? He can't hear, and he can't speak. And then he said to them, Then why do you worship him? Why do you pray to him? Why do you ask for him? You just said he can't hear and he can't speak. And they were astounded with this simple, easy logic. Why do you worship other than your creator when it's so simple right from the beginning? Listen to the message. Worship your creator not that which he created. Simple? Simple. One of the beautiful facets of Islam. Islam, like any precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Let's explore the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, we're going to be exploring one of the beautiful facets of Islam. And this particular one I call inclusive. Because we see Islam as being all-inclusive. As we've discovered in some of the other facets, all of the universe is a part of Islam. Islam being the verb or action, aslama, and that is that someone is or something is surrendering and submitting to the will of the Almighty. Doing what God wants it to do on his terms. So. The universe, the heavens, the earth, and everything in between, the mountains, the rivers, the streams, the trees, the flowers, are all doing what God wants them to do. Therefore, all of this is in Islam. But now I want to particularly talk about the human being and how inclusive Islam is here. Because Adam, being the first of the human beings, was doing what God wanted him to do. Of course, until he made his mistake, but the point is that he was obeying God. 
And in that sense, he was in Islam. When he made his mistake and ate from the fruit, he was still in Islam because he did the thing that Islam calls for. That when you make a mistake, you repent. You turn back to God and ask him to forgive you. This is what Adam did. This is what Eve did. They repented and they were forgiven because God forgives. So from them, and this is what's important to know, from them came all human beings. But yet all of them are included when Allah says in the Quran, Ya you are nas. Oh, you human beings. He says here, Oh, human beings, have full regard and be dutiful to your Lord who created all of you from a single soul. Wahid, one. This clearly establishes the inclusiveness of Islam because when it says the one, it's talking about Adam. And clearly from Adam until now, all of us are being addressed by the statement, Ya Yuannas. It means all humans. God is speaking to you, telling you about the need for you to have the proper relationship for your Lord. It's amazing. What's really nice here now is that I can understand regardless of the time, anywhere in history, even before Muhammad, peace be upon him, a person could be in God's religion. Because the religion with God is monotheism and submission to him. He tells us about the people before, the people who were here before Muhammad, peace be upon him. Those referred to in the Quran as the Ahl, people of the Kitab book, meaning people of scripture, Jews, Christians, and any who followed this scripture. He tells us that these people who came before, they didn't separate, they didn't divide up until these proofs came to them. And that's when they divided themselves up and went into these schisms, these very sects of belief that they had, or disbelief, if you will. And he says, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَبَدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُدِينَ هُنَفَى وَيُكِ مُسَلَى وَيُتُ زَكَى وَذَارِكَ دِينُ كَيَمَى And people were not commanded anything more than to worship their God alone, Hunafa, in monotheism, to establish the regular worship, to pay the poor do, the charity. And this is the true religion or the true way, the true deen of Islam. And the word that was used here in Arabic is deen. I want to focus on that word, deen, because again, it's a part of the inclusiveness of Islam. You see, if we go back to the people of the book, we find that that word was used before. The same word. If you look, for instance, in the New Testament, in the book called the Acts of the Apostles, this is the fifth book in the New Testament after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then this book, The Acts of the Apostles. And here we find this word being used real clear by Paul. Paul is telling the people that he used to persecute the followers of Jesus. He says he used to persecute them, meaning to abuse them physically to the extent, he says, he even persecuted them to death. But look what he calls them. He calls them the people of the way. And that word, way, is capitalized. It's a big W. If you look in the translations, it has a big W when it says way. The reason is because it was understood by the translators to be a proper noun. It was the name 
of the religion of the people of Jesus. They called themselves Ahldin, people of the way. That's what Muslims call themselves today, Ahldin, people of the way. And that's what Allah is telling us in the Quran, that all of these people were Ahldin, people of this way. What way are we talking about? The way of understanding, understanding that God is one and then submitting in pure and beautiful surrender to his will and peace, showing a person what they need to do. And as they do it, that way that they're doing it, to the best of their ability, that's deen, that's their way. And this is inclusive because, as we said, it doesn't just come with Islam in the desert 1,400 years ago. It goes all the way back, the time of Jesus, the time of Moses, the time of Abraham, and the time of Adam. Inclusive. Everybody has a chance. Everybody has the opportunity to be in this way, in this being. Now, as we mentioned the people, the tribes, it also includes all ages. Whether if it's a small child or somebody very, very old. In the case of the small child, as soon as they are born, they are considered in Islam, regardless of the religion of the parents. I really like this. Because the parent could be a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Christian. They could be any of the different sects of Christianity. They could be Jewish. They could be so many other things, the parents. But the child, at the moment of birth, immediately is considered as someone in the proper deen, the proper way of submission to God or Islam. I like that because when you reflect on it, consider this. A woman has a child and something happens, the child dies. Any woman would be distraught and upset. And we would agree that, you know, this is something, this is hard for her to endure. But now, you're going to come to her and talk to her about where her child is. According to the other religions, they will insist that the child need to have been baptized or inducted into their faith, or the parents have to be of the particular faith. But Islam is saying it doesn't matter. We know the child went to paradise. So regardless, the woman would find that whatever her religion was, her child is in paradise, is in heaven. And isn't that better? Certainly, that makes me feel better. I know if I had to tell a woman that had just lost her child, if I have to tell her that her child went to hell, I, I don't think I want to tell them that, do you? But you don't have to because Islam is clear. The child is innocent of whatever other religion the parents had. The child is in paradise. And that's because Islam is inclusive. And that's just one of the many facets. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back with more about the facets of Islam. Well, we're back and we're talking on the subject of the facets of Islam. And in this particular segment, we've been dealing with the subject of Islam being inclusive, all inclusive. Of course, we talked about the universe. That's all part of what's in Islam. We spoke about tribes and nations, and we talked about the individual. We talked about children being in Islam. How about someone who is very old, someone really, really old? And they were a good person. They believed in God. They were trying to do God's will, basically, okay? But then when they get real old and their mind is not firm anymore and they're starting to do strange things and even misbehaving, I want to use that word, doing things that are, well, bad, really bad. And this happens a lot of times to the elderly. And it's something in dementia that they can't help. Now, what would be their condition? They, and they were a lovely person. They used to worship God appropriately. They used to be good. They used to do many good deeds. But now in this condition, in this Alzheimer's or dementia, now they are uh, 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 saying bad words, doing things in and they die in this condition. Islam is telling us that don't worry about it because they can't help it. 
This was not something they did intentional. This was not something that they wanted to do. This was something like a breakdown. Therefore, they're not responsible for it. Islam tells us the pen is lifted. This isn't recorded against them. The same holds true for a person who's mentally ill or suffers from some kind of mental disease that they're just not able, not able to comprehend, and they're doing the best they can. And this is so sweet because we learn in Islam that nobody is burdened more than they can bear. Allah doesn't put a burden on somebody more than they can handle. And nobody carries the burden of somebody else. La yukallifu Allahu nafsin illa wusaha laha ma kasabat wa alayha maktasabat. This is so sweet when you read this and understand it that Allah, the creator, the sustainer, he knows what's inside of you. He knows what you're trying to do. He knows what's hard for you. He knows what's easy. And regardless of what the others think or what they consider, that doesn't matter. It's between you and him because it's so totally inclusive that it doesn't matter what you are, what's happening around you, that if you're doing your best and you're submitting to him as much as you can, he knows that and it's up to him to be the judge. I love that. Sometimes a concept like this takes a few minutes to get adjusted in your mind, to really think about it. Review with me just for a second. Let's go back over that and look again. What we're saying is that if somebody came at the time of Abraham and he did his best to follow his prophet, he's included. What if somebody came at the time of Moses and he did the best to follow his prophet? He's included. What about those who came later with David and Solomon, with Jesus the Christ, John the Baptist, with Muhammad, peace be upon him? All would be included, but carry it another step forward. What about the people that come after us? What about the very last days? What about way down the line? Could they still be included too? As long as they recognize that God is there, is one, and... They are trying to do what he wants done to the best of their ability. They're included. So if we now look to the subject of these various groups, and we know that the Jews divided up into many groups. The children of Israel broke off into so many different groups. There were the Pharisees. There were the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Ossenes, the Nazarenes. So many different groups, schisms, then Christianity and how it broke up into the Orthodox, into the Catholic, and to the Lutherans and the Protestants. Then there were the Baptists and Methodists, the Church of Christ, the Church of God, the Church of God in Christ. So many different ones. Then we look to the Muslims and we see, oh my gosh, you guys are dividing up the same way. The smart move, of course for all of us, is to set aside any kind of nomenclature which might separate us from the mainstream of the deen. It would be really wise to take these names and toss them and stay right in the mainstream and just say, I want to be Ahaldeen. I want to be in this mainstream, to be included of those who recognize one God and just want to do things his way on his terms. That would be the best. But regardless of what a person says with their mouth, Allah is looking into their heart. And regardless of how you may group somebody, and you might say, well, this guy, he's with this particular menhaj or methodology, or this lady, she's with this group, and they're, you know, they do this or that. But again, we go back to how Islam is so inclusive that that isn't really the whole subject, is it? So it's up to him, the creator, the sustainer, the provider. It's up to him to tell on the day of judgment who is included in his salvation and who is included in the paradise and who is going to be forgiven and all the rest. It really is simple, isn't it, when you think about it? And it's attractive, too, to consider that anybody... Anytime, any place, 
could be included, included in this particular facet that we're talking about now. I wonder, really, if we sit with someone, regardless of their understanding of religion, just sit with them and without mentioning religious names or sex, just talk about it in the general term. I wonder if they'd be more amenable to the subject. Without going into this particular, you have to be from this place, you have to say these particular words, just to keep it open, keep it inclusive. There is God. He's one. We need to do what he wants to do. By the way, I've used this on a number of occasions. And when I did, I found that people immediately were receptive and began to think and began to open up. And we were able to tear down a lot of barriers and people were able to see better what we're talking about with real Islam. Not some phony, baloney Islam that some imam or mulana came up with and said, you do this and you do so and so. But really the essence, the inclusive concept that is for everybody. Whoever wants to understand, whoever wants to take the time, and open up their heart, open up their mind, and just say, bring it on, bring it on, let's have it. And then, could be, they'll be guided. What's really amazing here is that when the person asks to be included as one who's being guided, we see how Allah, the Creator, begins to guide them. And they don't need to say the word Allah. In my own case, I'm living proof of that. Because I didn't say Allah guide me. I said God guide me. That was the word I used. And that word didn't even exist, by the way, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yet he accepted it and guided me into Islam. Even though I used this word God. So we can see, it's not just the words, is it? It's the intention behind it. And to be included in Islam is to have the right intention. We mentioned it before, but it's appropriate, I think, to mention again that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told us, bin niya, that for sure all the actions, all the deeds are going to be rewarded according to the intention. So to keep this intention pure, and for the sake of the God above, and this will keep the person included in this, in this dean or in this way. I recall that when I was talking with a Catholic priest before I entered into Islam, that he talked to me about this same idea. He told me that in Catholicism, one of the things they did was to study Islam. And he said in his studies of Islam, although being presented by non-Muslims, in texts, curriculum, written by non-Muslims, it still used the basic words that I'm using right now. And he said, I found this to be something really sweet, pure, simple, and inclusive. And that is that anybody could do it. Take, for instance, the example of the person on the desert island. How did they get there? And who knows? But still that person could be included as well because all they would have to do is look around. Maybe they'll see a coconut in a tree and say, how did the coconut get there? Hmm? If they realize, I didn't put it there. How did it grow? How did it come up? How did the tree come from a seed? How did all this happen? Except there must be a God. There must be something there, you know? Now, he doesn't have anybody to talk to. He's by himself. He doesn't have any book, he doesn't have a Quran, doesn't have a Bible, doesn't have a dictionary, doesn't have the encyclopedia, maybe he doesn't even know about reading and writing. But he knows that that coconut came from somewhere. He knows he didn't do it. And he decides, you know what? There must be a God. And he sees the sun coming up over here. It looks like it's going down over there. Maybe he doesn't understand that the earth is turning. Maybe he doesn't. But he knows something's happening up there. He knows he's not doing it. Comes to the conclusion there's a God. God is one. And he wishes he could please his God. And that's enough. That's enough right there to be included. Now, what about the one 
who just doesn't get the message at all. And I've had people ask me that one too. And I said, well, what about the story of the one I just told you about the desert island? And they said, yeah, but what if, what if? Okay, listen to this. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told us that on the day of judgment that God himself would then give that person the ample opportunity to be tested to see if he would really do God's will. And if he would do it, he could still enter paradise. So there's no way that anybody's excluded from this beautiful deen, this way called Islam. And this inclusiveness is one of the many beautiful facets of Islam. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host, here with Facets of Islam. I'm going to be talking today about one of the many beautiful facets called proof. Now this may sound strange to you, but when we talk about Islam, we have something called proof. In many religions, you find people telling you, just believe, just have faith. Basically, don't ask, just believe. But I found something really strange about Islam, something very beautiful. And this particular facet is the proof of Islam. The way it came about for me is many years ago, I was actually trying to convert a Muslim to my religion. And while we were talking, he made a statement that surprised me because he said, I'll go to your religion if your religion is better than my religion. Whoa, got him, because I know from what he's told me himself. Islam, you have to pray five times a day. Islam, you have to fast one whole month out of the year. Islam, you have to pay a certain kind of charity called zakah. You have to make something called hajj, a pilgrimage to some place in the desert. And you have to be nice to everybody. You have to do so many different things. And I said, look at this. In my religion, it was very simple. You just basically say somebody died for your sins, and that's it. But then he said something else. He said, I will go to your religion if it's better than my religion, but you'll need proof. I said, what? Proof? Proof? Man, <laughs> let me tell you something. My background in theology, I know for sure religion is not about proof. It's about faith. He said, in Islam, we have faith, but we also have proof. And I said to him, do you mean to sit there and tell me as a Muslim that you can prove there's God? Then he said to me, do you mean to sit there and tell me as a preacher for your religion that you can't prove it? Well, I was shocked. I said, what are you talking about? He said, all right, in Islam, we have clear, testable evidence indicating that there is, without doubt, God, he's one, and that all creation comes from him, and that all will go back to him for the day of judgment. I said, oh, sure, you got proof. <laughs> I'd like to see that proof. And then he started to bring it. And this is truly amazing. Now, when we talk about the proof in Islam, the word in Arabic is ayah. Ayah. Ayatollah. The proofs from Almighty God. In the Quran, there are 6,327 verses called in Arabic ayah, proofs. Every single verse of Quran is considered in Islam to be a proof. I thought, mm, 
how? Show me. I mean, I need to be, I need to be totally informed here or I'm never going to catch this one. What do you mean? Proof. <laughs> he said, okay. Look at the Quran itself. Just look at it. Begin by opening it and see what you find. I said, okay. From the very beginning of the Quran, it starts out by saying, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Okay. In Arabic, the meaning says, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Now, at first, you might think, okay, so what? But then after you begin to reflect and think about that, it's telling you who it's from. It's telling you who it is from. It's from the Lord of the world the most gracious, the most merciful. Then he began to explain to me that each of these two names, Rahman and Rahim, are two of the characteristics of Allah. And they are actually the perfected characteristic or the epitome of the word itself. Allah is totally merciful, specifically merciful. That's amazing. Well, to the one who's not fully initiated to Islam, doesn't know Arabic, he's going to go, I still don't get it. Well, it's kind of like when you receive a letter, isn't it? Even in ancient times, when messages were sent out, correspondence went from an emperor or from a king. They began out by saying, in the name of emperor so-and-so, in the name of the sultan such-and-such, in the name of the king so-and-so. And here it says, in the name of Allah, and then it tells you two of his characteristics. Well, again, to the one who's not really initiated to Islam, they're going to go, okay, where's the proof? Well, just take it easy, step by step. Because the next thing is to look at the very end of the Quran, the very last words, because the Quran claims that it's coming to the Alameen. Hmm? It says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. The praise is to the Lord of the Alameen. What worlds is being spoken about? And the last words of the Quran itself explain it and give you the answer. Minul Jinati Wanas. It says, from the mankind in jinn. Jinn are the unseen and human beings. These two are the worlds that are being talked about here. So this is basically a letter, a message, a recitation coming from the Lord of the worlds to the humans in jinn. And it starts that way and ends that way. And everything in between is the message. I said, okay, well... Hmm, I don't see where that's a proof. But keep reading. And as you go through, use your mind. Logic is another one of the many facets of Islam. Use your mind and see what you perceive when you start to read. What comes into your mind as you read and think. And they believe in what's being sent to Muhammad. It means the Quran. And they have to believe in what was sent before. I said, now hold on a second. Wait a minute. I said, what do you mean now? He said, in the belief in Islam, according to the Quran itself, Muslims believe in all scripture. Anything that has been revealed to any prophet of Allah, Muslims accept that and believe in it. I said, like what? He said, scriptures that came to Abraham. And I have heard, as a Christian, I had heard about Apocrypha. In fact, I have some of the books of Apocrypha in my own library. These are books hidden from the public. These are not the normally published parts of the Bible, and yet they refer to such things as books of Enoch, or Idris, as he's called in Arabic. The books of Abraham are mentioned here, and others that are not ordinarily known. And here it's referring to all of these, these scriptures. And it even refers to Abraham, and it refers 
refers to someone called Idris or Enoch. And I'm thinking, hmm, how is it you know about all of this? And why is it important to insist that the believers of Islam have to believe in all these previous books? Does it include the Torah? He said, absolutely, read it. It's there in the Arabic language. The Torah. Wa Injil, which means the gospel, that which came to Jesus. The Zabur, that which came to David. And that was coming to the, the Psalms, coming to the prophets. And you're thinking, wait a minute. But still, I don't see that as a proof. He said, wait a minute. Islam is also inclusive. And that's another facet of Islam. And that inclusiveness is one of the next door neighbors to this facet, which is the proof. Mm, I don't know. He said, just keep reading, keep reading. And as I went through step by step, I began to hear in the Quran talking about Adam and his creation and what the angel said at the time of his creation and how Allah told him to name the various things in the creation. The story comes about the children of Israel. So many different things were coming, one by one by one. And I was thinking, but are they really proofs? And what I want to do right now is take a break and let you think on that. And then when we come back, we'll pick up right there. So we're going to do this and we're going to come right back with more facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. This is Yusuf Estes. We're back talking about the facets of Islam. We've been dealing with the subject of proof. Now, we want to get little bit more into this subject and really begin to put the pressure on and ask about this proof. We've been talking about the Quran, some of the essential ingredients of Quran, how it comes, but let's get into the real, as we say, nitty gritty. I want to know some real proof. Show me. Well, the Quran offers some challenges, some rational arguments, which obviously will work with rational people. So when we think, clearing away the cobwebs, start with a clean slate and ask, where did this come from? Question comes in the Quran, and think about this, that if you're in doubt about it, then bring a book like it. Now in 1400 years, nobody's been able to do that. Another statement from the Quran, bring pen Chapters like it. Nobody's done that. And then finally, bring a single chapter like it. A rhetorical question comes in the Quran that says, Have not the unbelievers considered if this, meaning the Quran, were from other than Allah, they would find within it many contradictions. And we find no contradictions in the Quran. Now we'll come to the subject of miracles what some people call miracles of the Quran. The science that we know today absolutely conforms with the many things mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago, yet those people had no concept of such things as hydrology and the way that water cycles and how it evaporates and comes back. They didn't know that. In fact, at that time it was thought that the Wind blew the water off the oceans and lakes up into the air and then just fell onto the ground. But yet the Quran describes the vapor and how it condenses, talks about how hail is formed, talks about a lot of the things that people only recently discovered about how electricity is formed and lightning is created within these clouds. The subject of mountains and how a geologist today would look into any of his books and say, yes, this is known today, but how 1400 years ago did anyone come up with this idea of these deep roots going way down from these mountains across the Caucasus mountain range, all the way across Europe, holding down deep, and they do hold the surface of the earth in its place and keep the earth from wobbling as it turns. The subject of the earth turning wasn't known at that time yet, we find it described as kawa, kawa, or turning. The idea that the sun is in an orbit was again only recently understood. Yes, the earth orbits the sun, but the sun also is in an orbit. 
How about the idea of going into the Earth's atmosphere to the extent that you go out of it and into outer space? Now, when I was a boy, when I was a boy, this was unheard of. If anybody said they wanted to go out of the Earth's atmosphere, if they want to go to the moon, they would have called them crazy. In fact, they used to laugh and tell somebody, oh, just go to the moon, ha, 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 meaning something that's impossible. Yet, right around the 1960s, we began talking about space travel as though it were common. People were going into outer space and finally landing on the moon. But look what it says in the Quran, chapter 55, verse 33, and we're talking 1,400 years ago, and it says, Oh, you assembly of mankind and jinn, come together, all of you, and try to go outside of Earth's atmosphere, and you'll never do it. Illa be sultan, except by a mighty power. And now consider this. When you put fuel into your car, how do you buy it? You buy your petrol by the what? the gallon or the liter, but yet when they put one of these rocket ships into outer space, they buy the fuel for it by the ton, tons and tons and tons, hundreds of tons of fuel to lift that rocket ship up, 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 and put it into outer space. Think, how did anybody use such a statement that perfectly describes that? That power and authority required to go out of Earth's atmosphere. The subject also in this same surah, chapter 55, Surah to Rahman, tells us about the seas that come together, but they don't really mix because one is fresh water and the other is salty, and they never really mix. And also, where the two seas come together, where there is the different temperatures and salinity, the different life forms, the different vegetation, and these also... These also never cross the barrier that's there, and the barrier is mentioned in the Quran, talking about something that was only discovered just a few decades ago. How? And then consider that the Quran is not a book of science. It's not a book of history, although it has some very important historical information. One of the things that impressed me very much as I read this was a prediction in the Quran about something that happened before and it was going to affect something that would happen in the future. It says in the Quran, the meaning of it is that Pharaoh, Pharaoh is the one who chased Moses and his children of Israel into the Red Sea, and then Allah closed this Red Sea around him and drowned him. And Allah said, because he's an enemy of Allah, Allah says that he's going to preserve him in his body as a sign. Preserve him in his what? In his body as a sign. Now look that this book could not be from a human being because the thing that it says is that this person, Pharaoh, would be preserved in his body and become a sign. Do you know that that same body, that same person was embalmed for all those years, then his body discovered and then he was put on tour and he was shown in Chicago in the museum and the universities there and in other places around the world this body of this pharaoh is being taken around and people are looking and it is a sign, isn't it? Dr. Maurice Bukhai, the French scientist that I've been talking about, accepted Islam just as I did after I became convinced that this Quran, this recitation, this beautiful speech of Allah could not be from a human being. It could only be from the creator and the sustainer, the most gracious, the most merciful, the ruler on the day of judgment. Could only be from him. Now, some people need more convincing. They need more proof, and that's fine. One of the beautiful aspects, one of the beautiful facets of Islam is there is proof, so much proof. You could spend the rest of your life examining the stories of the Qur'an and then realizing the reality of the things that it's talking about. You could also study the life of the person, Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was sent with this, this recitation. 
and then look to his life and see what he was doing and what he was saying and what he was teaching, and then you would be forced, if you were honest, to conclude that this man truly, truly believed that there was only one God and that he was the messenger of God to the human beings. One of the clear proofs that comes out of Islam is the Quran. This Quran still exists today as it existed at the time of this Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You see, he did not know how to read nor write. Therefore, he heard from the angel Gabriel and he recited to his companions. They, in turn, heard it from him and recited it to the next generations. This continued generation after generation up until this very day that people hear and recite, hear and recite this Quran, this recitation. And what's beautiful about that is not a single word is changed. Not a letter has changed. It's still the same. The meaning is there and it's clear in a language that's alive today. Arabic language is spoken in many countries around the world. And it's spoken anywhere you find Muslims. Consider this. Indonesia has the largest concentration of Muslims in the world. And their language is not Arabic. Yet, they're Muslims. And they recite the Quran in Arabia. If you go to Turkey, their language is not Arabic. But they are Muslims. And they memorize and teach and understand the Quran in the Arabic language. The UK, the United Kingdom, obviously is not a Muslim country, yet it has many Muslims there, some of them native, original, from right there, who, like myself, convert to Islam. And again, there in the UK and in America, people are learning the Quran in the Arabic language and reciting it in the Arabic. There are over 10 million human beings today who have totally memorized the entire Quran. And 1.5 billion human beings who have memorized portions of it, like myself and all the other Muslims, and we recite it in the Arabic. It is the only book on earth that if we lost all the books on earth, we could bring it back exactly as it was in the first place because the Quran is inside the hearts and minds of so many human beings today. If I stopped right there and said that's all there was is proof, this would be sufficient for most of the people if they truly understood. But there's so much more. The proofs in the Quran, when it touches your heart and you understand, when you're looking for something that nobody knows what you're looking for except you, and then suddenly you just find the answer right there, right in front of you, even in translation. And Quran is not Quran unless it's in Arabic, yet translations are there to help you get at least a sense of the meaning of what's being said. This proof, this facet of Islam, is one of the most beautiful of all of the facets. And yet there's so much more. So much more. And we hope you'll be with us for more of Facets of Islam. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is Yusuf Estes, your host, today on Facets of Islam. We've been talking about these facets, a gem called Islam and its facets, its Parts that make the whole. And in this episode, I would really like to stress the facet called truth. The truth of Islam. 
one of the important parts of Islam is truth. And it's absolute truth. Allah tells us in the Quran, in chapter 17, about the real truth. It says, وَقُولْ جَاءُ الْحَقَّ And say, the truth has come. And falsehood has withered away. Verily, the falsehood is bound to wither away. This is telling us that the truth is there. Now consider this. Truth, like a gem in the earth, is there. Whether you know it or not, it's there. It's covered up, but it's still there. It has something surrounding it, but it's still there. And if you take the time to search for it, and then remove the covering, you will find the gem. It's as simple as that. And this is the truth. This is the truth of Islam. Allah tells us about the importance of truth in the Quran. He tells us, Ya yulladina amanu attaqala wa kullu kawlan sadida. O you who believe, have taqwa for Allah and always speak the truth. This word taqwa means to put a barrier between you and Allah's punishment. So we usually translate it to mean, be righteous, be dutiful, be pious. O you who believe, have piety for your Lord and always say the truth. In another place in the Quran, we find Allah telling us to bear witness to the truth, even if it's against you and your own people. Even if it's against you. Now, in America, we have something that allows a person to be silent. He doesn't have to bear witness against himself. It's called the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution that a person does not have to bear witness against himself. But in Islam, we find that that's not an option. You have to tell the truth, even if it's against yourself. Because you're going to be asked by your Lord, and he already knows anyway. But you'll be asked on the day of judgment, so you might as well go ahead and confess. You might as well tell the truth. When a person lies, what happens? Before you know it, he's going to have to tell another lie to cover this one. And then another, and another, and another, until he has a web of lies that entangles him to the extent he can't get out. In fact, there is a saying that we have in English that says, Oh, the tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. So deception also is a part of lying. And all of this, all of this kind of lying and deceit is disgusting and forbidden in Islam. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told us something about that as well. He said that when a person lies, there's a black spot on their heart. And they will continue lying until the whole heart becomes black. Look at this. In another saying, he was telling his companions about this, and he was saying that there is rust on the heart, like the rust on metal. Rust on the heart like rust on the metal. His companion said, Oh, Prophet of Islam, how? How could we get this off of our hearts? He was saying by what? By reciting the Quran and by thinking of a law. This is all a part of the truth. Now, some of the facets that we've talked about in other episodes deal with the subject of the Quran, deal with the subject of Allah, but here we're starting to see now how these other facets work together to provide us with this facet called truth. Because when we understand the proofs that come, and we understand how Allah is proving to us that he, in fact, 
is a law, we discover another thing that his name, one of his names, he has so many names or characteristics, one of his names is truth. He is the truth. Now, you or I could be truthful, and that's good, but no human could ever be the truth, because that would mean you were absolute and perfect in it, meaning you never deceived, you never lied, and there's nothing about you that has any imperfection. But Allah is perfect in this, that he is the absolute truth. Now, all of this is playing, playing in here in this one facet of truth. And you can look at it from different aspects and different views, and you see different texture as you look at it and think about what is true. Now, here's one little test that you can do with yourself to remove everything from your mind and everything from your heart, totally relax, and then... Only allow things to come into your mind that you know you can prove. That you know for sure are true and there's proof for what you say. I want you to think about this. Sometimes we consider something true because people have told it. Told it to us so much that it just seems like it must be true. But yet we don't have any solid evidence. One of the examples I like to use is when I talk to people from Christianity and I ask them, consider when you were a child. Think back, as a Christian, your parents, your grandparents, your uncles, your aunts, your cousins, brothers, sisters, teachers and preachers, everybody was telling you about Santa Claus, telling you about his sleigh and his reindeer, and about the Christmas tree, and about how he comes on Christmas Eve, comes down the chimney, gives the gifts to the children. And this is a common story told so much that in the mind of a child, there's no doubt this is the truth. But then I ask them, how old were you when you found out there really was no Santa Claus? Because at that moment, you learned an important lesson that just because people say something, even the majority of the people, even if everybody says it, it still doesn't make it true, does it? It's important for you and I that when we want to know the truth, to consider what is the proof for what's being said. Evidence. What's testable? What can I look at? What can I test? Now, each time Allah, God, Almighty, sent any messenger, any prophet, to any people, he sent them with the truth. But then he sent them also with evidences that the people could test to find out, is this really true? Moses, peace be upon him, is a classic example. Because he was sent to Pharaoh. And he went to Pharaoh and he said, I'm a messenger of God. And I'm telling you that I, these are my people. Let them go. Or something bad will happen. Pharaoh wouldn't listen. So he struck out his stick, his staff, and it became a snake. And he reached out and picked it back up. It became a staff again. He put his hand into his vest or his coat and he pulled it out. And it was white, white as snow. Put it back in. Pulled it out again, it was normal. Pharaoh didn't care. Then pestilence came, pests came. The frogs, the insects, the drought, the water turning to blood, all of these signs, evidences coming. And Pharaoh kept saying, okay, until it would go away, and then he would deny again. These are just some of the proofs that came with Moses. What about when the water parted? What about when he was up on the mountain? All of these things come as proofs about this truth. Now, what I want you to do, reflect on what I'm saying, just for a few minutes. I want to take a break. Give us some time to assimilate this. Then I'm going to be right back, inshallah, with more about the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes, and we're back with more facets of Islam. 
We've been talking actually about two facets of Islam, the proof and the truth. The discussion that we left was that of Moses, peace be upon him, and his people. Pharaoh didn't really accept. He didn't want to believe. So many signs came to him, yet he didn't want to believe. Oh, he would acknowledge it just to get the thing to go away, whatever difficulty came his way, whatever pestilence was bothering them at the time. And he would agree just to see if he could get rid of the problem. When his own son was taken, his son died, he was distraught. And he finally let the children of Israel go. And they went away. And they went to the Red Sea. But then Pharaoh changed his mind again, took his army and went after them, chasing them into the Red Sea. Now, when they got to the Red Sea, the children of Israel were stuck. Where were they going to go? But then Allah caused the water to open up. And Moses took the children of Israel right through the water of the Red Sea. They walked all the way across to the other side. Now imagine what this must have looked like to those people at that time. They must have been amazed. And now here comes Pharaoh right behind them. Couldn't he see, look at this, the, the two sides of this big sea parted. Dry land in the middle that he could cross with his army. Couldn't he see the proof right in front of him? But you see, this is what happens when the heart is hardened with these lies that we were talking about. The heart, after so many lies come to it, is as hard as a rock or harder, harder than a rock. And it can't see the truth anymore because it's nothing but lies. So when these big evidences come, it ignores them. And that's what he did. And then he was destroyed. Him and his army destroyed. The water drowned them. But what about the children of Israel? And stop and think what they had been through. And then when their prophet Moses, peace be upon him, went up into the mountain, and he was up there for so many days and nights, getting revelation, the commandments, to take to the children of Israel. And while he was there, what did they do? Didn't they melt their gold and make a golden calf? Didn't they worship that calf instead of the Lord of the worlds? And didn't they get in trouble? Wasn't Moses upset about this? How could they do that? And these are children of Israel. It's because every human being has the capacity to tell the truth or to lie, to choose the right or choose the wrong. It's always up to you as a free agent to choose what you want. If you want to see the truth, it's right in front of your eyes. But if you're not willing and you want to continue to lie, then all of the talk in the world is not going to change your opinion. All of the proofs, all of the evidences that prophets have brought, yet people turned away. There was a prophet, one of the Arabic prophets, who came to his people, and while he was showing them about this important subject about worshiping one God, they said they wouldn't believe unless he could produce for them a miracle on their terms. And listen to what they demanded. They said, we want you to take this huge boulder, this giant rock, we want you to bring out of this a camel. But not just any camel, a valuable, special, rare type of camel, female, that's 10 months pregnant, ready to deliver. Do that, then we'll believe. And look what happened. Allah made that boulder crack open like an egg and out came this full-grown female camel, pregnant, ready to deliver. And did they believe? Oh, some of them did. But some of them didn't. Even though they saw it with their own two eyes. How much proof do we need? Now, some people... Some people don't need a whole lot. Just a little suggestion. Just a little something, a reminder. And they're okay with that. Others need more. 
Some want volumes. Others want to discuss and argue and debate ad infinitum. But the beautiful thing about Islam is that if you want the truth, it's right there in front of you. Anytime. Truth is right there. Now, it's easy for me to say that. And it's just as easy for you to sit there and deny. But there's a test that you can put yourself to. I recall some years ago when I was visiting up in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, up in that area. And there was a professor who was speaking about the subject of how many women came into Islam. And he was saying that every one of these women all said that they came to Islam because Allah guided them. Now, these women were in different countries speaking different languages, yet they all had exactly the same story when it came to that. Why did you come into Islam? They said, because Allah guided me. He rejected that with his own mouth after he said it with his own mouth. He said, they all said the same thing. For me, the conclusion is and there must be some common denominator. Why not investigate the possibility there could be a God and he really did guide them? Couldn't we just maybe look at that? But he said, no, he can't accept that because he's an atheist. And as such, he can't accept that there's a God. Therefore, they weren't guided. Therefore, he still doesn't know why they went to Islam. And by the way, some of them may have been atheists before, but they became believers in Islam. Others could have been other religions, and they became believers in Islam. But this man can't accept that. Now, usually what I like to do as a test for anybody who really wants to know is just ask them to do this. It's your heart. It belongs to you. Nobody else knows what's in there but you. Huh? So here's a test for you. Clean it out. Now, this is not an easy job because you have to remove all of the bias, remove all of the preconceptions that you might have, get rid of anything that you don't have absolutely clear proof for it. Get rid of that. Clean it. Then, in this condition, ask, ask, if there's a God somewhere, you can say it like that, or just say God, as I did. God, guide me. God, guide me. Now, if there's a God, he heard you. In fact, he knew you were going to do that before he did it. And if you're honest and you really want to be guided, then it's up to him to give you that guidance, isn't it? Isn't it? So then, when the guidance comes to you, you will know. Because you did it all in your heart. Nobody knew you did it. You do it in private. Just on your own. God, guide me. And show me something. If you need a proof, if you need an evidence, ask him. And he can give you that proof right in front of your face. But if you don't get guided, then whose fault would that be? Will you blame God? Or you blame yourself, or will you consider that maybe you didn't really clean the heart out to start with? Facets of Islam are very much connected with each other, interwoven, and you can see, once you start studying and looking, that each one of them really works with other facets at the same time. They're not exclusive, they're not individually wrapped. No, they all work together because it's one beautiful gem, this gem called Islam. But for sure, this concept of truth and proof has helped so many people catch the essence and start to explore and start to ask questions. And what we're going to do, even now, we're not going to insist that you believe anything. In fact, that's not, that's not how it works. If this would be the case, then it wouldn't be real Islam anyway, because it has to start inside of you. So we're not going to tell you, believe this, believe that. No, what we're going to say is something even better. Just start with nothing. 
and then watch what comes and build off of that. Start with nothing and just keep asking, if there's a God, show me and see what happens. It's pretty simple. Straightforward. But if you'd like help along the way, certainly we can give you the benefit of the experiences that we have. Many of us, we've seen the Quran, even in translation form, help so many people catch the essence of what this is about. Reading about the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is also very beneficial. Because one of the things that's important to know about him, he was called the truthful. He was called the truthful, a sadiq. Because he never said a lie in his life. Stop and think about that. Have you ever told a lie? <laughs> Today. <laughs> He never told one in his life. So how would it be that somebody that's known to all of the tribes and all of the people of his time, he was known as a Sadiq, the truthful person. The truth is, La ilaha illallah. There is no God to worship except the one and only God. That's the truth. And it came with something called the Haq, which is now, again, the truth, the Qur'an. It was sent by the truth, which is Allah. He is Alha. And it was put into vocal form by the one called the truthful. So how much more evidence do you need to at least consider the truth in Islam? Only Allah, only Allah is the absolute truth. So I ask him to put the truth in your life and in my life and make us understand, accept, and practice truth. Until next time, Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.